Welcome everybody. It's good to see everybody again. Uh, we need to approve some minutes, don't we, Rachel? Yes. All right, I would like to call on Vice Chair Steve Piercy for that, please. I will move for their approval. Okay, uh, all those in favor? Aye. All right, all right. Uh, do we need a roll call? Let's, let's go ahead and do it. Commissioner Piercy? Here. Commissioner P? Here. Commissioner Phillips? Yeah. Commissioner Dodd? Here. Commissioner James? Here. Mr. Anthony Johnson? Present. And Chairman Cush? Present. We have a quorum. All right, thank you, Rachel. All right, we're moving right along. Uh, Bishop, if you would like to come up and uh, give us a solid waste report, and I think you have a presentation. Yes, yeah, when the time's right. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bishop Wagner. I'm the Rutherford County Solid Waste Director. Uh, last month, Rutherford County Landfill accepted 227.05 tons of brush for a revenue of $7,827. We also managed 1,242 tires for a revenue of $1,421. The total combined revenue for the month of April 2023 is $9,248. <coughs> Excuse me. Rutherford County Solid Waste disposed of 3,438.66 tons of waste from all sources in the month of April. 2,880 tons were from convenience centers and 558.66 tons were from schools. We recycled 335.11 tons of, from all sources. That is a diversion rate of 9.74% for, for April. Um, Commissioner P had asked me to include these, this in the report and I had it in the report for last month but of course I was, I was unable to attend the meeting but I've followed up with that again for this month. Costs associated with landfill ac activities broken down. We've spent 11,200 uh, for manpower and equipment to manage the brush pile. We spent $3,520 on scale house administrative staff. And we've paid Liberty Tire Management, which is the recycling company that manages our tires, 30,526.30. Um, that's a total cost of 45,246.3. Um, and a revenue of $9,248 for a net uh, loss of $35,998.30. Now, the, the uh, Liberty Tire Management money, they do pay a dollar in to the Department of Revenue that we receive quarterly. So I've been monitoring that with, uh, with uh, the Finance Director Michael Smith's office to see uh, what that's looking like. And we do end up, when the money comes back, making a slight uh, net increase. So that, that Liberty Tire money and that deficit that's there, um, it's probably closer to the cost for the, for the scale house administrative staff and the manpower as the deficit. Have any questions? On the, on the tire disposal, what are we charging the general person to leave tires? We, they're charged $1 per tire or, or uh, $65 per ton for mixed tires. And what does it cost us to dispose of them? We, get, we pay $70 a ton to dispose of tires with Liberty. So we're going in the hole? Yes. And then we also collect tires from, from um, the, the litter crew picks up tires. There are tires that are illegally dumped at our convenience centers that we have to absorb the cost on those as well. How long has it been since that uh, cost was increased to leave a tire? It hasn't happened since I've been here. It'd be something to think about. Sure. Are there any other questions on my reports? If I, if I could, I'd like to invite uh, Dan Salisbury to, from, from HNA to come up and give us a, a report on the progress with the transfer station planning and engineering. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as he said, I'm Dan Salisbury from h and Engineering. We're the firm that was hired to um, design, permit, and then prepare the bid for construction for your solid waste transfer station. Um, see if you could back up one slide and put it in presentation mode, please. 
So the first slide up there uh, is a summary of what you guys hired us to do. It was broken down into three different tasks, the first one being design, then the permitting, and then lastly, uh, preparing all the, all the information so we could put this out for bid for construction. And uh, the mayor signed the contract on March 17th, so I'll show you what we've done up till then. Next slide. Okay, so just to orient you, if you haven't been out there or not familiar where we're putting this transfer station, the top of the screen is north. Um, right, right in the middle, uh, you see the script there. That's the existing Rutherford County solid waste building. Uh, and then generally running east-west across the, the bottom part of that map is the east fork of the Stones River. Uh, and as you see on the map, just a little bit southwest of where the script is, it, it shows you where the Rutherford County building is, that's where we're looking at putting the transfer station. So if you focus on that for the next slide, it'd be a, a little bit of a blow up of that same location. So just to orient you to that, uh, on the northern part of that, uh, the page you're looking at is the, um, just a reference where it is on the ground, is that existing Rutherford County uh, solid waste building. A little bit southwest of that uh, is the empty trailer storage. A little bit southwest of that will be where the transfer station itself will be. Uh, if you continue generally southwest will be the full trailer uh, parking area, which will be covered. And then going back around uh, counterclockwise, it'll take you up to the scale house and the in and out scales. So that's generally what we're looking at for the footprint of the transfer station. And if you wanna follow on the graph there, you see the blue arrows. That'll show you roughly the flow of traffic for uh, the folks coming in dropping off solid waste. So your local collection trucks will follow that. They'll weigh in, they're full weight. They'll go to the tipping floor where the transfer station is, dump their solid waste. Uh, follow the blue arrows out, um, get weighed out, weighed empty, um, and get their, we get their weight ticket and then they're back, back on their way. Um, if you look at the red arrows, that'll show you what the long haul traffic will be. So they'll come, come down Landfill Road, they will um, break off through the empty trailer area, go to the, the transfer station pit, what we're designing it with two different pits there. Uh, they'll, they'll go in the pit, get loaded up by the loaders, um, and then they will go through the full trailer area, and then depending on how you want to run the station, we can either have them go over the scales to get a full weight before they go to the landfill, or they could bypass and you could take the take the ticket at the landfill uh, when they weigh in at the landfill. So that um, we could do either way. But that's roughly what it's gonna look like, where we're looking at putting it, and roughly how traffic's gonna go in and out of that transfer station. Yes, sir. Is any of that on that particular drawing in the floodplain? Is it? No, sir, it's not. No, there is, there is um, some a portion of it further south, a little bit southwest that is in the floodplain, but where we've put it, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about it in the, if the upcoming slides, we've got some surveyors on the ground now. Uh, we're doing some geotech work just to make sure that's the right spot because we don't want to build it and then have, find out there's a cave or something underneath and have a collapse. So, um, but looking at all the resources we have right now, that looks like the best spot to put it. Dan, what's what's the total footprint uh, acreage wise of this facility, including the ingress and egress um, to the scales and out of the out of the area? Uh, I, I owe you a spe specific answer, sir, but uh, it's roughly ten acres. Thank you. Question for you. Yes, sir. Looking at the way the arrows are drawn at the at the single point of entry uh, creates a bit of a bottleneck. I'm wondering what kind of traffic flow, maybe this might be more for Bishop, can we expect at that location and, and how backed up could we expect that to see? Or should we look at trying to make sure that bottleneck doesn't exist? Well, we, we've looked at a couple designs. So we actually looked at putting the scales and scale house further up Landfill Road. Um, it's kind of the plot of land to east of there where that the existing pond is. You know what I'm talking about? If you back up a couple slides, I could tell you where that is. But we looked at, at separating the scales and scale house from the transfer station, but for the sake of cost and the utilities and all the drainage and everything that's gonna have to be um, engineered into this, it, it, it's gonna be a less expensive option to put it all in this one location. So that, that was one of the factors, um, but we, we haven't so far identified any, any major issues with, with traffic being backed up going through that choke point. 
um, with, with, the, with the size of the footprint and the, and the path around the transfer station. I don't know if that answers your question. But. It, it does, but I'm just, I wanted to play cautious with creating the bottleneck or because it just looked like it would, has the potential of being one and um, seeing over at the middle point, seeing how they can get lined up waiting to, to get through, I can see how a, a high influx at, at some point, depending on what our flow would be, we could actually create our own if we could get ahead of that. Okay, okay, we'll take a look at that. Do you have anything yeah. to add to that? So to answer the first part of your question, uh, I would think that on the maximum, uh, you know, full capacity, we could be looking at up to 200 uh, trucks in and out, so, so 200 total vehicles in there to dispose of. Of course, over the cor course of the day, we will have a queue. We've, this design allows for a line for the queue. If we get backed up in one direction or the other, we do have access. There's two scales on the, this setup. So we can turn both the scales on to inflow scales or outgo scales to try to keep that, that manage that flow in and out. Um, it will require a little bit of, uh, of moving around and, and, and working out some kinks as we go forward, but I'm confident in this design and the fact that we'll be able to, to maintain traffic flow and get, get folks in and out. And we're not gonna see anything like the experiences that we have in our current situation as far as wait times and ability to get, get trucks in and out of there. If you go to the, any other questions on this slide? If not, if you could go to the next slide, please. So, had some, some um, just want to clarify what the, what the transfer station itself is going to look like. So, what you have up on the slide there is just a sketch that, that was sent to me by one of the companies I reached out to when I was looking for approximate costs for these structures. So that's what it looks like. And if you go to the next slide, there's a picture of an example of one that's in North Carolina that was uh, constructed not too long ago. And that shows you real life what it's gonna look like. So it's a metal building uh, covered. It's, it's open on one side. And in this example, you've got a, a pit on, on the left and right side of the screen. Uh, the concrete in the middle is called the tipping floor. That's where the waste is dropped. And then loaders pick it up and they put it in the long haul trailers. And this example is similar to something um, that we talked to Bishop about doing is having a, the ability to separate the tipping floor. So you're able to handle MSW and C&D at the same time. And it's, it's a move, movable barrier. So if you end up having 30% C&D waste and 70% MSW, you can adjust the size of your tipping floor. So it'll be similar, similar design, but this is just an example to show you what it, the transfer station is gonna look like. Any questions on that? Hey, Anthony, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. So I'm assuming the pits will have super compactors. Uh, it's. I'll, I'll show you the cost here here in a couple slides, and and that might kind of guide whether or not we're going to go that route. We have discussed that. Um, the the compactor that I got a quote for um, is one that can be integrated into the pit, or it can be with some conveyors used outside of the pit. Um, it is a costly. Piece, piece of kit, um, but that is something that we talked about integrating into the design. But yes, it could go right, the, the compactor could go right into one of those pits, yes sir. And this, this $20 million price tag includes the machinery? It's, the, the well, I don't, I don't know what it's gonna be yet. We haven't, we haven't done the engineer's estimate. I don't know what the, the amount's gonna be yet, sir. We owe you that by the end of May. Um, I don't know how, how we're gonna to wanna to do it. There is some equipment that you guys are gonna to have to buy. Um, I, I owe you a better answer, sir. I don't, I don't know if, um, if that's gonna be included in your total amount or if you're gonna purchase that stuff separately. For example, the loaders, the forklifts, um, um, backhoes, anything else you buy to support this operation. I don't, I don't know if that's gonna be included or not. And I apologize to you for putting you on the spot because it's probably not a question really for you but that's what we're talking about. <laughs> so the, 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 as of this moment, the focus of what he, he's, he is going, uh, Dan and H&A and, uh, have gone out and they're, they're looking at costs for 
for us to acquire equipment. Um, they are also looking at cost of equipment for the functionality, the utility of the building, the service, the, the transfer station and all the services that make it work. So the cost that they're going to give us will be cost for building and then we also will have a cost for what the equipment cost will be for running it and get up uh, a list for that. The, the, total, <coughs> the total costs um, we'll know more at the end of May once they get some prices back on some of the you know, concrete and asphalt prices and some of that to give us some kind of idea of an estimate on that where or how we'll, we'll uh, obtain the, the mobile equipment, the heavy equipment for operating the transfer station. But uh, you know, I think we can speak more to that in the June meeting when we come with that and I'll have so, a better answer for you as far as how exactly we plan on funding the, that portion of it. Chairman Don. Thanks, Chairman. Just is that a, to your knowledge, is that a hundred thousand square foot, excuse me, a 10,000 square foot building, give or take? It probably is, it's probably pretty close. The one we're looking at is a hundred by hundred, three, three sided structure. It's, I could, I could double check, but I'm pretty sure it's close. Yes, sir. So did that answer your question? That your, your last question, what did that answer it? Basically what H&A is, is the engineering estimate we're going to provide is going to be the engineering estimate for the site work, for moving dirt, uh, some filling in where it needs to be filled in, um, including all the concrete costs. Once we get the site designed, we can figure out what all the concrete, what the asphalt's going to cost, the structure, um, and then we're including a lot of the other stuff that you'll see here in a, a slide or two. More of like a menu of here's some of the stuff we know you're going to need. And, and we can help, you know, help you get with the right folks to, to purchase this equipment. Um, that might be a little bit above and beyond the engineering estimate that we owe you, but, um, but we've already reached out to these companies to find out what it costs. Because I was particularly concerned with all the COVID-related delays, you know, something that used to take three months to get now takes a year and a half to get. And we're still seeing that. Some of the responses I've gotten from vendors is, yeah, that, that thing's going to be 14 months. So between you ordering it and getting it delivered. So that's, that's why we're adding that stuff to the engineering estimate because it it's, it's, could trip you up if we don't order that stuff at the right time. So roughly what did this building cost? I know ours will that be a little different. But. Um, that building uh, delivered, w one of the vendors was delivered and installed and that doesn't include any of the concrete work. We have to um, have the concrete vendor that's gonna lay the floor make sure he gets the right specs so he has the footers in and, and um, designs the pit, the concrete work in the pit. Doesn't include any of that, but just the structure itself, I think it was 232,000 from, from one of the vendors. I've got several, several quotes. And if you could, were there any other questions on this slide? Are you designing the building that we're gonna build yourself? Uh, it, it's a pretty simple structure. Not, I mean, there will be some that, engineering design involved in it with, like I said, the, uh, how the concrete needs to be poured in the pits, um, whether or not you're gonna pursue a compactor, it's gonna have to be designed a little bit different to accommodate that compactor. Um, but the building itself is, is pretty, pretty simple building. What type of ceiling clearance does the building have that you're gonna design uh, for I think us? the one we looked at were 28 foot and 30 foot. So this transfer station we're proposing to build, are they gonna dump their trash outside and push it into building? No, sir, no, sir. It, it's, it, the, the structure itself is covered um, and the, the waste is dumped on the, on the tipping floor and then is moved around inside. It, it should not be stored outside. My no, sir. My point for this question, you cannot dump a 45 foot trailer in a 30 foot clearance roof. It won't happen. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take that note, sir. If everybody uses a walk-in floor, it'll work, but everybody doesn't have walk-in floor trailers. You'll go out to uh, Republic and watch them dump them all day long. They put them on a rail and stand them straight up, just about. And they're 45, 50-foot trailers. Okay. I'll, I'll make sure our, uh, the CAD guys doing the site design um, Take that in consideration, sir. For a second. The, the 53 foot trailers won't dump in this. This will be roll off size trailers and their maximum is 24 foot at tip from 
from ground to, to up. So we'll get we'll, we'll expect to see, um, of course, front loaders that can push out directly, um, and then uh, side side loaders that can push out directly and then roll offs that lift up at 24 feet. So uh, 30, 30 feet would be sufficient and is a pretty much a standard for these, these facilities. So we're gonna spend $20 million and just accommodate up to a 24 foot trailer. There's, there's, no, there's no larger waste trailers. I mean, a roll off containers like we use out here are as big as it gets. We're not gonna dump 53 foot trailers on the tipping floor. We'll take waste and we'll load it into 53 foot containers and they'll get hauled out of there, but they won't be dumping, so they won't, they won't have to lift up, if that, if that makes sense. So we're restricting it to just our trash only? What, the truck, the trailers and stuff that we have? There's, well, no sir, the, there's no, as an industry standard, the roll off truck is the largest truck that's gonna come and bring waste to us and tip. We're not going to have 45-foot tra trailers that are coming to tip. If there's a 45-foot, uh, you know, super wagon that goes, they're going to go directly to landfill. They're not going to try to to take that to go to transfer station to reload it in a 53-footer. The size of the tri the trucks that we'll be doing are the same size that we run out in the county. That's that's a standard. It's industry standard. This uh, there's no. We're not going to be getting any bigger trucks than that to dump to us. Now we'll get a lot of smaller ones. We'll get uh, you know smaller. Uh, you know, eight yard single single axles, eight yard trucks that dump out there from smaller commercial entities uh, and things like that. But um, I don't anticipate that we'll ever have anything that'll be any bigger than that. And if on the rare occasion that somebody, if it was ever to happen, if somebody were to come out there and have to dump, the concrete pad that's out there, they could dump on the outside of that pad and we could push the waste into the building. But I don't anticipate that'll ever be needed. No other questions, please go to the next slide. Uh, this is just an internal document. I just took a screen grab of it that shows the rough timelines for the three different tasks that you hired HA to do. The first one being um, the engineering design, uh, which started uh, when, the, when the mayor signed the contract, and we anticipate that being done uh, on or about July 1st. Um, the next one, task two, is permitting. Again, that started uh, prepping some of the permit paperwork. Uh, when the mayor signed a contract, and we estimate that'll go out until September 1st. Uh, the third task, uh, the bidding, preparation of the bidding documents, we anticipate taking, uh, taking up much of the last quarter of this calendar year. So everything should be done um, by, the middle of, by the middle of December this year. Next slide. Just a, a quick summary, a lot of bullets there, but it, it just summarizes what's been done to date and then what we still have left to do. So at the bottom or the top of the page starts with uh, March 17th signing the contract, goes through some of the requests we had to fill out, some of the paperwork we had to fill out with TDEC, uh, requesting uh, bids from survey companies, from geotechnical companies, and it goes on down, down the list um, to prepping uh, the permit by rule or PBR packet through TDEC. We submitted it for an initial review, got that back with no comments, so that has been submitted. Um, I've submitted the paperwork of the Corps of Engineers for attempting to use a dry, a dry hydrant um, for the daily wash water for the tipping floor and for fire suppression reasons, so that paperwork is in. Uh, and then just today I submitted the CUD paperwork um, in an attempt to try and get water and sewer down, down landfill road from from East Jefferson uh, as one, one possible option. And then, so, and there's a lot of stuff in between there, but those, those are major activities that have been done to date since the contract was signed. And then the bottom of the page, some of the stuff we still have left to do um, with getting the, the survey crew got on the ground yesterday, they're doing the survey work. So once we get that survey, the results of the survey for the existing, uh, the topographic and the existing conditions on the ground, um, along with the geotechnical work that's going to go on this Friday, um, that's drilling and select spots um, on that, that plot of land just to make sure that there's, there's nothing under, underneath the ground that's going to come up and, and bite us later on. Um, once we get the results of those, we can take our rough footprint, adjust it, make sure it's in the right spot, um, and then start looking at the stormwater. Once I get the stormwater plan, uh, then I could submit to the county paperwork, um, the county application, and 
let's see what else do I have up there. The stormwater permit uh, through through TDEC. Once we get the stormwater plan, I can submit that all the way down to um, working on those that bid paperwork, which is task three. So that's some of the stuff we'll be hopefully putting in the top column uh, the next time I come up and talk to you guys. Uh, but that roughly covers what we've done to date. Any questions, gentlemen, on that? Yes, sir. I noticed on that first drawing where you had the layout of the facility that you had some sewer lines drawn in there. And that was part of the reason I was asking about the floods on there. Have y'all looked at the possibility of sewer uh, attack? Uh, I know that the landfill the Republic has got sewer connection. Yes, sir. Yeah, there are several options. So right now, um, the the solid waste building has well water, sulfur water. Um, it's well water, and they have a, a septic tank. So we've got different options based on what, based on some of the the permits I'm requesting, uh, whether or not it's going to be feasible, um, physically or financially, whether we do these other options. But right now, we could we could maintain the well water and have a septic field, which you saw the septic field on, on that sketch. Um, should it be financially doable to, to um, tap into those lines up on East Jefferson to bring water and sewer down that way? And then we're also looking at another option, uh, the southern route to tap into the, um, the, the cities, the Murfreesboro, Murfreesboro's uh, water and sewer lines. So we, we have some different options. We just have to wait and see what, what comes back approved. If, if I could, let me uh, provide some additional information to this committee in this regard. This is something, uh, Dan, if you, yeah, thank right. you. I just want to be able to see the commissioner. This is something uh, Bishop and I have been working on probably 60, maybe 90 days, because this is a significant issue for this facility. <clears throat> As you probably, some of you may or may not know, we were informed that Atmos Energy had a um, bore underneath Stones River going from that facility over on the other side of the river. And so we've attempted to locate that. We've locate that, located that. And we've, you know, what we are looking into is the potential to bore underneath Stones River both water and sewer, uh, which would uh, address those concerns directly because we're going to need that for a number of different reasons, which are rather obvious. So I asked Bishop to f just get reach out to an engineering firm that does boring to find out preliminary just ballpark what's this, what would something like that cost two different boards based uh, and do we need TDEX approval and I think what you came back and said no we don't need a TDEX approval uh, but the approximate cost to bore from our proposed site location to Murfreesboro water and sewer which we've already had some conversations which they're very open to us tapping into would be three hundred thousand dollars would that be right for for both bores both water and sewer so that's that seems to be the most feasible solution although certainly we haven't settled on anything and when we get to that point we'll bring it to the committee so water and sewer we think uh, commissioner would be boring underneath stones river and then into the uh, murfreesboro water sewer facility across the river well I asked for obvious reasons. That's a lot of property there that we're looking at developing more and more in the future. And, you know, I think we could be limited if we're just looking at a sewer system. So. Mr. James. Yes, sir. I was kind of curious so on the site, as you said about with, the, I think it was the, the lost which one it was, but it was when you're kind of looking underneath to make sure you don't run into something, whether sinkholes, caves, et cetera. Do you have a secondary site in plan in case you do? Well, or I mean, we there's, just lose more, those there's a lot more space on that. We, we call it the western footprint, that, that same area um, where, where we're looking at putting this. There's more, there's more room a little bit further southwest. Eventually, you get into the floodplain, um, but the, the, there's more room there. Um, there's also the location on the eastern plot uh, where the convenience center was going. That's where we're looking at putting just the scales in the scale house if we had had two separate locations. I don't know if that's going to be big enough, um, that, that eastern plot, but that is a, a possibility to put, to try and put everything on the, that eastern, eastern plot. Does that make sense? But I guess the shorter answer is there, there's more area right there just looking at looking at the topo and the existing resources we have short of the survey and the geotech um, where we've got it right now seems to be the smartest place to put it 
Okay, I'm just hoping that you we don't lose the couple months that we've gotten ahead. Uh, if, if you can just be prepared to shift if needed. Yes, sir. And, and the survey crew, we assigned them that entire western plot to do uh, topo in existing conditions just so we have the information uh, for that for that entire, I don't know if we, we call it a peninsula or whatever you want to call it. Um, so they're doing, doing topo in that entire area just so we have that information in case we have to move it. If no other questions, uh, next slide, which I think is my last slide. Uh, this might be a little bit hard to read um, from your seats, but I think you have it on your screen. So again, this was just, um, does not fall in line with, directly with the engineering estimate for, for, for the transfer station footprint, but this was to give you guys some, some costs of some of the items that we think you're gonna need. Uh, starting with the top, the loaders, uh, got a, a recent estimate from a couple loaders for a similar size transfer station over in North Carolina, um, just get, getting the cost. And that, that was the longest lead time. That was 14 months if you want to get one of those loaders. Not saying you have to get that one, but we just want to give you an idea of what things are costing time is these days. Uh, moving down, there's some skid steers on there, some skid steers with some forklift attachments. Uh, I think I have three flavors of forklifts up there, a used one and a couple new ones, uh, whether you want to go propane or electric, um, a backhoe, you know, if, if you don't go with a compactor, you still might want to compact that trash into the, into the long haul trailers um, using a backhoe just to kind of squish it down a little bit more. Uh, and then you see down a little bit further down, there's a fire suppression system in there um, that some other facilities are using, remote monitored uh, fire suppression, um, just in case there is something that causes the waste on the, on the transfer or on the tipping floor to catch fire. Um, so that is an option that we could look at. Um, and then you see on the bottom that transfer station specific compactor um, is about a um, million and a half dollars for that, for that compactor. So not saying you have to go with that one, but that's one that's out there that is currently being used in transfer stations um, if you wanna try and compact that trash. So I just provided this stuff to Bishop just so, again, so we're not surprised at the last minute, like, hey, you built us this stuff, we didn't, we didn't know we had to buy all these loaders and things, but you do need that for the successful operation of the transfer station. Bishop, you are figuring on this building to be sprinkled, I assume. Say again, sir? The building will be sprinkled, I assume. Um, don't know yet. Um, the, si the size of the transfer station, um, I don't believe it has to by, by regulation. I don't believe it has to, uh, 100 by 100 structure. Um, but if that's something, something the county wants, we can. Well, I mean, we you just brought that. up a fire hazard. Uh, that's why, you know, the thought ran through my mind. You know, I mean, our, our state fire marshal will let us know whether it's required or not, but I just wanted to know if you were figuring on it being in part of that bid. Yeah, we, we weren't looking at sprinkling it based on the size of the structure right now. Um, but again, we, if, that, if that's a, something we want to pursue, well, I can, we, I can, we can speak incorporate to that. that into if, the design. If, our, if Tanya and uh, Josh Sanders deem it necessary and appropriate, it will be. I mean, that's just, that's the bottom line. Oh, We're gonna, well, I mean, that's, that's a decision, uh, Commissioner. I think Josh Sanders on fire marshal and Tanya Bell, our coach director, are going to make that decision for us, and we'll, we'll absolutely use their guidance in making that determination. We'll make sure it's in the bid package. Well, I, I concur. And of course, they are, they're following state regulations, and they can go str more stringent if they so deem. Part of the reason why H&A brought the fire suppression unit up there was because of the question mark as to water and sewer, where we're going to have uh, potable water, we're going to have to use a tank, how are we going to be able to, to deal with those issues as they come up. And this is a, a system that's used in the industry. Uh, in fact, the company that we, we take our recycling to has an example that, that works, works really well. They kind of showed it to us. This is a, uh, but it is, it's one of those things that if we had a sprinkler system, I mean, that would, that would work as well. Um, it was kind of a covering our bases kind of situation to have that in there. So he, I think in this list, he went pretty exhaustive with all of the potential yeah. items that we have to have. That, that top dollar up there on the top is if everything's included. And I'm, I'm sure that, well, I know for a fact that a good bit of that won't be necessary. 
um, because, of course, he's got multiple different kinds of tow motors and, and skid steers and things like that. So, Yeah, I ignore that figure at the top, uh, gentlemen. That's just the way I had my spreadsheet configured. It, it summarized everything on the top. Any other questions? If not, I think the next slide is just a question slide, if you had any. Yes. Anthony, go ahead. So for clarification, are you saying the fire suppression was in the bid, but, but not a sprinkler type? It, I guess kind of what the mayor said, if, if we need it in there, it'll be included in the engineering design. Yes, sir. Um, but that was just the, the fire suppression system is something that Bishop and I had talked about. We actually went and looked at one. It, it's pretty high speed, but it's also pretty expensive. Um, so that, that's kind of like leather bucket seats if, if you guys want to go that route. But cur currently, it is not specified in, in the contract you signed with HNA whether or not we were going to include a sprink sprinkler system. That w wasn't that specific. But if it's required, as the mayor said, if it's required, it will be incorporated in the design and then into the construction bid. So neither one are incorporated in, the, in this cost, in the, in the bid? In the construction bid? Yes. Um, not right now, no, sir. Okay, so neither one. Well, let me jump in here. We're not. Oh, both have been mentioned and kind of confusing. Well, <laughs> so this is just the engineering and design. So we're not to a construction. Bid yet. Bid, we're not to a construction bid yet. So when a con contractor is going to bid on okay. this facility based on the engineering requirements created by this H and A, it, it better be in there if, it, if code requires it, or they won't be able. They won't get the bid. So that's something the contractor will have to put in his bid specs. It's, does that help? Yes, sir. Uh, personally, I don't think that we can, no matter what co code says or not, we can't afford not to have fire suppression, some type. It may not be the one that we saw on our tour, because, I mean, that's state of the art. I mean, it, it found a hot battery in a pile that wasn't even smoking, but it would have been a fire in just a few minutes. So, I mean, yeah, that's high tech, but sprinklers work too, and it's not as high tech. So, but I think we need one or the other. Can I, if I can follow up on that, I just want to know, has anybody checked to see sprinklers or the suppression system uh, for our insurance for the facility, which one would actually benefit us better? Uh, it's just a factor. I don't know. I couldn't answer that. Uh, Commissioner James, the so as far as the end build outs, and I think maybe this will help clear some things out, what what H and A has given us up to right now are some of the potentials. And then when at the end of the month they're gonna come to us with an estimate of what that, that number costs based on, on on those. And when we go into this portion of it, I want to include any possible thing that we could we could need for this to give us a number that's gonna be on the on the higher side so we're not running into anything that's unexpected. Then when we get into the into the let's talk about getting the 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 bids out and get those things, then we're gonna get specific about needs, wants, et cetera. Um, fire suppression is important in a facility that has people in it, and I agree. And I mean, we'd have to have some sort of fire suppression, no matter, you know, whether it's fire extinguishers, whether it's, but I would believe that if, if the cost, it, it, it makes, if it makes sense for us to do it to save us on, on what it's gonna cost um, from an insurance perspective or from, from a safety perspective, you know, from a liability perspective, of course, we'll do that um, as part of the construction when we build it out right. Uh, the, but this system in and of itself, the reason that uh, I asked him about it was, it is very high tech, it's, it's really, it works really well in this industry because with lithium ion batteries in particular, if they run into the waste stream and they get open and exposed to oxygen, this system um, can see them, locates hot spots and can warn you about a fire before it happens instead of a suppression after it happens and then you dump water on a lithium ion fire and it doesn't too, do too great of a job. So. Um, so I wanted to see what the, like you said, the leather seats, I wanted to see what that looked like from a cost perspective as we came into this and then once they give us what some of the material costs are gonna be, we'll work down to a number that's gonna be something that we can all live with. Thank you guys. 
I'm sorry. I have uh, one more question if, unless we're done. So there was a conversation, Bishop, that you and I, and uh, I don't know if it was you, Dan, or not, but we need to be prepared, this committee needs to be prepared to send out or prepare an RFP yes, for the destination for our trash. That is something that would need to be done fairly soon, Bishop, uh, based on the capacities and the tonnage that we think we're going to be moving out of this county in the next 18 to 24 months. Uh, Dan, it's my understanding we need to be thinking about that RFP sooner than later. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Can you expand on that just a minute? Because yes, this sir. is something this committee is going to have to address, I would think, at the next meeting. And so I just want to put it on your radar for us to discuss, uh, Chairman, that we talk about that RFP, what the purpose of that RFP and why it's necessary to do it now as opposed to a year from now. Thank you. Yes, sir. So the RFP um, that we want to get out on the street is going to give it's basically going to be a document that says, hey, we have this need at our future transfer station for this amount of waste that we think we're going to be generating, um, and we need transportation of that waste. That's the, the, the red arrows that you saw in the sketch. We need those folks to come in and, and tell us how much that's going to cost. And then maybe it's the same company, but we also need somebody to, to start giving us costs on what it's going to cost to whether it's taking it to an energy facility, taking it to a landfill, but to dispose of that waste. So transfer, transportation and disposal, uh, what, we're, what we're discussing was it'd be good to get that out on the street right now and start getting um, interested vendors to bid on that, to let you know how much they're gonna charge you to pick this stuff up and to dispose of it. Um, we, we can do the rough numbers based on the amount of waste, how many trailers, how many tons per day we think you're going to take in, how many trailers based at 22 tons per trailer, how many trailers you're going to need. Roughly, we think now between 50 and 60 trailers per day to haul away that much waste. Um, so we get that RFP in the street. We get vendors to bid on it. We can we sort like you would through any RFP, sort through all the vendors that, that bid on that RFP, and then help you guys make a make a, an informed decision on which vendor to go with because um, building this transfer station is just part of the solution it's not the solution it's just going to give you a place to consolidate that waste and be able to load that waste onto long haul trailers the other piece of this is we need to find somebody to haul it away and dispose of it so that's what the rfp is going to do for us that's going to help help complete this solution is that is that what you wanted, sir? Yes, sir. Thanks. Just, just to come. Were you the gentleman that rep, that uh, gave the proposal to us? No, originally? sir, I wasn't. That was uh, Ray Hoffman. Okay. He's the president of the company. Okay, very good. And I live, I live here in Tennessee. I'm the, I'm the H and A Tennessee guy. All right. So I just wanted to. Uh, you, you seem very knowledgeable, articulate. Uh, I appreciate the above and beyond information. So I just wanted to hear your credentials. Are you a civil engineer or surveyor or, or um, general contractor? Just kind of your background. So l long story, I, I spent most of my time in the Army. I'm a retired Army guy. Um, retired in the Nashville area because my, my oldest son plays hockey. We wanted to move to a hockey town. Um, I've been here for about five years. I've been retired about five years. Had several different jobs trying to figure out what I want to do. Um, and through a very old friend, um, who, who briefed here, um, asked, asked me to come work for him. And it's, I find, I find this stuff, I know nobody really likes solid waste, but I find it fascinating. It's, it's awesome because there's a lot of problems to be solved. Uh, so that's why I'm doing, I'm doing it. I've been doing this since January. Yes, sir. I'm going to ask a couple of questions that's not going to be real popular. And I'm also going to say that whatever this committee decides is what this commissioner is going to support, okay? This is not for you. This, this is for our solid waste guy. More than a year ago, um, the prior commission that was elected was told that the landfill has uh, a life expectancy of less than two years. This was year before last. So we felt a, an, an urgency to do something. Uh, the new commission was elected and that urgency still existed that Republic 
didn't have enough capacity and would close down by the end of the year that we're in right now, could possibly close down by 2023, no later than 2024. So we've been moving along these lines of a transfer station to stay ahead of the curve. Are you still convinced that that capacity at that landfill is no more than a year off, 18 months off, two years at the most? Yes, sir, I am. This commissioner is not. I've spent a good deal of time the last month at Republic, and I, some other commissioners have as well, and taken tours about what legally Republic can do. And Republic is telling us that that landfill will still be in existence accepting garbage at current levels for over the next five years over the next five years, and we're talking about incurring millions of dollars in cost right now and finding a place to carry garbage right now. We're going to be making those decisions when that landfill is still going to be in existence over five years from now. So if the urgency that was communicated to this commission and the prior commission as well uh, does not exist, why are we going to be spending millions of dollars for a transfer station right now when we could wait two, three, or even four years to do that? Why are we doing that? And talking about spending, once again, millions of dollars that ultimately at some point in time we'll have to do, but, but why is the urgency now uh, when Republic and, and there's a lot of us that have been out there and, and this commissioner absolutely positively believes that that landfill will it still be in existence accepting levels four and five years from now and maybe even beyond that. So that's my question. Why are we, why are we facing millions of dollars worth of expenses and trying to find place to carry our garbage when what we've been doing is still going to exist for the foreseeable future the next why are we dis why, do why is the urgency to find all of that and to to finance this transfer station right now when we're facing millions Chairman, I don't think that's an unfair question at all. And uh, uh, if I could be candid here, I'm going to be. Um, I don't believe what the manager of Republic Services says about their life of their landfill. Um, it's not in their benefit to tell us what their real life of their landfill is. It's in their benefit for us to be in a position to where we do not have a location to aggregate our waste so that we're de we are dependent upon them when they run out of space, airspace in their landfill to utilize a station and the, because our, our contract ends with free disposal as soon as that landfill closes. We're left holding the bag on, on waste disposal options and we will have no station to collect and aggregate our waste. The, that's, that's the first reason. The second reason is the costs of, uh, if, it's, if it's, and I'm just throwing $20 million out there, because I don't know how much it is. I hope it's less, right? Um, and I'm going to work my, my hardest to make it as, as cost effective as possible. Um, but the, the, the cost of that, that station today, if we wait five years, you can go on and add a third to it or maybe double it. So. The long t I'm looking at the long-term sustainability and the future of solid waste management here in, in Rutherford County as the solution. And the third reason is we can generate revenue off of these activities that will help the solid waste department become sustainable. And that can happen whether their, their landfill stays open or doesn't, because I will promise you that the small operators, the haulers that are operating in Rutherford County with Rutherford County waste right now that are collecting in some of the municipalities like Laverne and Smyrna and uh, are collecting from some of the companies and even some of the larger companies like potentially the waste management company will want to come to save their mileage on their vehicle 
vehicles and their wear and tear on their tires and all of the damage that's done going up on that landfill to come to a transfer station that's located in here, they'll pay the money to do that if we can stay cost competitive. So the idea that this is a, this is a money sink, yes, there's gonna be a cost initially. And I would much rather take the cost today and be ready for what happens tomorrow than to be set further behind the ball when Republic does what it eventually, they will eventually run out of airspace. Their play has been to wait and to put us in a position to where we have to grant them an expansion so that they can come into that valley in between the two landfills. That's what they want to do. They want to put us, they, they get on, the, their manager has gotten on television, talked about the crisis that we've created, all of these, these stories that, that he's been on every media outlet talking about these things, and the reality is they're job is to generate revenue to sell airspace for their company. Our job, my job, is to make sure that Rutherford County citizens have a place to be able to dispose of their waste. If I didn't feel like this was the absolute necessity for the county, I would never say that uh, the idea of spending millions of dollars is the best way to go. I firmly believe that this is the best path forward, and I hope that, that this committee and, and the full commission see things the same way, because if we don't do something now, we're going to be in a position, and it's not going to be five years. It's not going to be 2027 like he's saying. It's going to be earlier than that, and we're going to be stuck with no transfer station and a huge waste disposal bill, and we'll have no leverage to be able to negotiate a contract. So you're sticking with that, what we've heard the last few years anyway, is that the landfill does not have five years left. It has less than two years left. So one of the things that, that their manager has said repeatedly in, in meetings is that it's a variable, it's adjustable. He always say that when he says we'll, we'll end in 2027, but that number is adjustable. They control what waste goes into their facility. Currently, at the current rate that that waste is coming in from, from facility, we're at like $1.3 million, or excuse me, 1.3 million tons between uh, Davidson County and Rutherford County that were disposed in that landfill last year their rate of disposal is increasing. It's not, it's not slowing down. So their, and their estimated time on their end of life surveys as, it's, as they've been surveyed through TDEC and the state has decreased by two years every year that it's come up. Their last year was, their last end of life survey, end of life survey said four years. Um, if we're following that same trend and that's, that's how I do these things, I analyze them by, by the data, not by, by what their manager says. We're looking at 24 months before they're at, an, at this rate. Now, could they cut off some of their, their customers to make, it, to make that their open time longer? Absolutely they could. But the customers that they're gonna cut off are gonna be looking to, be, to have areas where they can dispose their waste that are in landfills that we need to be going to R, RFP right now and getting our finger in the book so that we're not left in the breeze when we're trying to get uh, an end of life solution for the waste that we do generate. So, and, and I appreciate those answers. Yes, sir. And I also appreciate your passion and your emotion, okay? I do. Uh, but what you're saying and what Republic's saying are two entirely different things. One of you is wrong and one of you is right. So if Republic is right, and there's more than five years left in the life of that landfill, and they're correct. Are we spending money right now that we could delay for another two or three years and not have to go to the bond market and borrow all this money to, to do this this year when we're doing other things? That's my question, is that if they're right, and time will tell, if they're right, are we spending money right now unnecessarily to take our garbage other places uh, to build stations, which we all know, I think that ultimately we're going to have to have that. But does it have to be right now? Your answer is yes. And if we believe what Republic is saying, the answer is no, you don't have to do it now. You can wait two or three years to do it. So that's the dilemma that this commissioner is in. Right Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to answer that question because that's a policy question. And, I, I, and, and to be very clear, uh, Bishop is acting under my direction in this regard. And so I need to let him off the hook, if, if you don't mind. So 
well, I just I want to make sure you have the answer f from the horse's mouth on how we got here, why we got here, and the assessment we made. You're correct if your understanding is is what do I believe about the time frame of the closing of that landfill because that directly impacts the investment that we're getting ready to make. I completely agree. And in my world, I'm doing what's called a risk assessment. And the risk assessment includes the reliability and the validity of the information I'm getting from Republic. And because they have historically in their public statements literally been all over the map as to the lifespan of that facility, I've been unable to put a lot of credibility into those estimates because they've been all over the map. I remember when um, it was at GNA Engineering out of Arlington, Virginia. I'm sorry? GBB. G was it GBB? Anyway, they made a presentation several years ago to Mayor Burgess and Mayor McFarland about the lifespan of that facility. And at that point in time, that estimate was six to eight years. Well, that was six years ago. And so everybody's been all over the map. And so what I did, and I think I've shared this, but it bears repeating, I did the only thing I knew, knew to do back in September is I asked Bishop in September, after I was sworn in to take me up there and say, up on our landfill so we could look across the valley, we could see the activity going, I said, tell me what the lifespan of this facility is before they're full. Bishop told me 24 months, 24, maybe 30 months, tops. I said, okay. I called Mac Nolan within 30 days and talked to Mac. I said, Mac, when was the last time you've been up there? And he told me. I said, I need you to tell me what the lifespan of this facility is. He said, Joe, I believe you're probably 30, maybe 36 months maximum. But he said, probably 30 and you may be 24 or less, depending on what we don't know is there, how quickly we're gonna move in there. Then I recalled Becky Caldwell. Now, these three individuals don't know that I called the other because I'm trying to verify information from the three people that I got to trust who can give me their best estimate. Becky told me 18 to 24 months. So that then being the case and knowing what we're talking about is an engineering design and construction taking at least 24 months on an expedited basis, was I, as the mayor, willing to risk not having a solution and getting into a crisis where our sole provider for waste services now can dictate to us a solution as opposed to having trash in the streets? That was unacceptable. You may be absolutely correct. We may miss the mark by a year or two. But even Republic's own estimate to TDEC says 2026-2027 into 26, first to 27. That's their most recent estimate in a GNRC meeting that I attended 30 days ago. Quite honestly, two, two years doesn't make any difference to me with regard to the risk that we are exposing ourselves to unless we have an alternative solution, a plan B. And I think uh, Commissioner Piercy has said it best for years. We need an insurance policy, and right now we don't have one. As a matter of fact, it was this commission that appropriated $5 million, well, it was the previous commission that appropriated $5 million for emergency transfer station in the event that Republic decided to close, close down prematurely. That money, a, a large portion of that money is still there. I think we're doing the right thing, but you're right. There are no guarantees, and I'm satisfied we're doing the best we can. Mr. Chair. My whole questioning was based upon the difference between what we were told and what we're being told from Republic, and they're really two different things. And, and everyone knows of our budget crunch and our, our the, the issues that we're having right now. And that's the basis for this question. Do we need to be spending that money right now? Your assumption is yes. Your answer is yes. Uh, so that's what I'll base my decision on. Timothy. I understand 
exactly where he's coming from because we are getting conflicting information. Now, I voted to build a transfer station not because I was worried about hauling trash out of this county. I voted to build a transfer station because we're having uh, loggerheads trying to get our trucks in and out of the current facility we're using. And sometime in the future, we're gonna need a transfer station. Now that's why I voted for it. But let me ensure that you know for sure that I am not gonna vote to go ahead and get a contract and start hauling material out of this county as long as we have a contract with Republic to take it for free. I'm not gonna spend that money now. Yes, I don't mind looking ahead to say, hey, who could do this in the future? But while they're under obligation to accept our waste right now at no cost to us, other than the misery we're put up with with the smell and the traffic and everything else. I'm not willing to spend millions of more dollars to start hauling this just because we want to feel good about it. Commissioner, I can tell you, Bill don't mind, so I can, <laughs> I, I can tell you the purpose of the RFP is not uh, to find an alternative method to removing our trash from the county when we already have an arrangement with Republic. That's, there's no financial sense in that. It's to prepare for when that facility closes. That's all that RFP is for, is to get it out on the street so that in, when that facility does close, we're ready. That's all that was meant and designed to do. Because you are in complete agreement on why would we haul our trash out when we have an, an existing agreement in, already in place. Well, that and I think that there are still room for us to negotiate with Republic. And like I said, uh, my folks are the ones that are getting the best whiff of this landfill now. And I still hope and pray that they can do something to take care of that smell. And that is probably the worst situation going on right now. But until they're able to do that, I'm not willing to give them an expansion. And even with the, uh, even if I was willing to give them an expansion, there would be caveats to that on what waste we would allow in if there was anything besides our own waste going in there. All right, we're ready to put this one to bed. All right. Chair. Over here. We do, yeah, thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes. I concur with Commissioner Phillips and Commissioner P. <clears throat> Bill today, or in 18 to five years, as far as building the transfer station, it's a gamble either way. There's so much information that doesn't agree with someone else's information that creates conversation we've just had or that we're having um, it makes us a gamble which do we do it's a gamble either way we spend 20 million dollars in a budget crunch right now unnecessarily or maybe it's not unnecessary we don't know that for sure so it's a gamble either way I agree there's room to negotiate with Republic. I, I do see that. Is negotiation gonna put this off too long? There again, that's a gamble too. Uh, that's just something we've gotta decide though. $20 million is a lot to swallow this, this budget year. But 20 million plus be hard to swallow in another budget year. So there again, it is a gamble. It's a hard decision we're going to have to make. I, I, I need to. I want to make something. Uh, I need you guys to. 
get out of my way so I can look. <laughs> you guys are. Hey, hey let, let's really quickly. Yeah. Let, let's uh, make a motion to approve his report, and then he they can sit down. Okay. All right. All in favor? Aye. And then I will bring you back up in a minute, Bishop, for your, your other item for your budget amendment. All right. Now, now the coast is clear. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, Mr. Chairman. So, I, I'm this. I have to say that we haven't been negotiating ready with Republic is not correct. That is absolutely not correct. I was in frequent and regular talks with uh, Mr. Amick, the president southeast of Republic Industries, on several occasions in my office. Mr. Klassen was a part of those negotiations. It was my clear understanding from this committee and from the county commission that one of the stipulations in that negotiation that this would be a Rutherford County facility in those negotiations. If this committee has changed its mind or if I misunderstood that directive, I need to know right now. Because when I communicate, communicated that in no uncertain terms as a result of the, what I thought were clear and unambig unambiguous conversations in this committee and the full commission, I relayed that to him and he said, the f we do not have a financial model to enter into a negotiation where we operate a Rutherford County only landfill. At that point in time, Mr. Amick, we cordially, respectfully uh, disengaged and I have not heard back from him. So that, that is exactly where we at, where we're at with regard to no negotiations. And I've, my door is always open, my phone is always available to have those discussions. But I want to reiterate, it was my clear understanding that one of the lines in the sand for a, for a facility expansion at Walter Hill was no trash from outside our county. I, so I need to hear from this body if, that's, if I misunderstood or if there's been a change in direction. I'd like to make a couple of statements. First, bearing on what I said before, I want to make it clear that I trust our, uh, our Mr. Bishop in what he's telling us. Now, that doesn't mean that he might be mistaken or off a little bit. And the reason I say that, and I want to make what I'm saying clear as far as what I believe the date could be. I believe the five-year date, and I, I want to tell y'all why not because I don't trust Bishop's assessment they made the statement that if the level stayed the same it would be five years they did make that statement now the levels have changed I know we've dumped a world of stuff from readable over there lately so that's made a probably a big bu uh, bump in that but Republic does have the option to limit what they're bringing in from out of county and they may and very well could cut back on what they're doing. Now they have contractual agreements with some of these other agencies that are outside other counties, other municipalities outside of us, but that doesn't mean that there's some that they couldn't cut back on and that it be a five year period. So I don't think they're lying to us. I think that they're saying, you know, this is something that could happen. So I, I just wanted to make myself clear on that. Now, since the mayor brought it up about stuff coming in from outside of the county, I'm tired of being in dumping grounds here for the rest of the mid-state. I think most of us are. And the only way we're ever gonna get a change is to negotiate a contract where we have to say on what can come in and come out of this county. To me, I think I can visualize assuming they take care of their smell and some of the other problems, us giving them expansion with us having control of what comes in to this county from outside this county, if anything at all. But it would have to be, for me to give them expansion, it would have to be under our control what would be coming in. Because there are inert things that could be coming in here that would not add to the smell you know, wouldn't help us on traffic and things like that. But like I said, to me, things like this are negotiable. Now, the mayor said they hadn't come to him to negotiate. I understand that. So I understand where he's coming from. But again, I keep hearing 
uh, these huge uh, tax increases that I'm, I'm hearing about. And if we can delay and have a lower or, or smaller tax increase by delaying this for a year, then I may look at that too. Anybody else? Steve? Oh, sorry, hold on. All right, Phil. Just that I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that the mayor's had a sense of urgency, just if no for no other reason, it's spurring conversation. We're way ahead of the curveball if we are surprised or shocked. And number two, I'm grateful that that sense of urgency has compelled a design because we don't know what it's going to cost. $20 million has been a, uh, a swag of scientific wild guess. With this information, if nothing else, and this information will have a pretty long shelf life, but this will get us our cost. A design, specifications, all the reports that Dan mentioned, and then we can have a more knowledgeable conversation, even if we postpone it a year or two. So I'd, in all these things, I hope we don't delay this particular, this activity, and have a bid package ready for December so we have a realistic expectation of what it will cost if it's next year or five years from now. This design will have a shelf life. Thank you, Phil. Just to follow up on that, all of what you're talking about, all of those funds are already in place. Right. Right. Okay. Joshua, you have something to say? I'm kind of just kind of frustrated. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm new. I'm still in my first year, but I'm looking at it like whether you're being told on the short end, one year until it closes. Uh, the max end, it sounds like six years until it closes. It just feels like we're hedging our bets. We're making sure that we're prepared, we're safe, so that our citizens don't don't have trash in their driveway for a year or two build out yeah. <laughs> and just let it pile up there. It's just, I, I don't know, I, I'm baffled on that. Uh, and then to hear that, that we, when we don't even know the price tag, that could be 20 million. We just don't know it yet, but you're afraid to go to the bond market for that. But 10 days ago, 156 million to bond market was, you know, all for it. I, it just, it's laughable when you're looking at a, that, that some for three schools, three school districts, and I'm not arguing that, I'm just comparing to this such a small comparable sum for countywide that the entire county needs and would benefit from. And I, I just, I really, I guess no point, I just, it just kind of baffles me to see that and watch that go unfold and I just felt like I had to say something on that one. Thank you. Come on, I want to hear from you. They probably don't. I'm going to stand up for what little I've got to say. I may be wrong, but I think we're the last county in probably the U.S. with free dumping. I think I've heard that through Republic's report. Common sense would kind of lead you to believe they're not going to cut somebody out that's paying right. to throw their trash away because they're in the business not to just bury your trash. They're in business to make money. They're a multi-billion dollar corporation worldwide. They run over people like us every day with smoke and screens and dog and pony shows. I've been to a lot of their meetings, offered lunch, multiple tours. I was offered one here days ago. Unfortunately, I couldn't go. We've been on, I've been on this trash committee for nine years. Heard the same song and dance on and on and on. What are we going to do? We've looked at everything in the world from diamonds to jet fuel to do with our trash. This is maybe 20 million, you don't have any idea. Some of it's been 100 million. This is on the low end right here. You know, we can play along another year or two and not do anything, but they have full control over their landfill and we have none. They can shut their gate tomorrow if they chose to 
and we couldn't do a thing as a committee about it. The mayor couldn't do anything about it. It's their gate. It's their key. We have no control over that. You know, if you want to keep gambling, rolling the dice, sooner or later we're going to get caught with our pants down, and then we're going to have a problem. I don't think Mr. McPhee would want us dumping it on his parking lot over here on the Rutherford Boulevard where he don't use it quite often. It's about the biggest parking area in this county that's not full all the time. He's not going to let us do that. The transfer station is something I've hustled for the last four years. You know, it's a simple solution. You cannot keep throwing the tax increase out in front of our trash issue I know it's important but our trash is just as important as the new schools as our infrastructure it's a very important item that's going to really cost if we don't move on this now I'm not for a big tax increase either Robert but I don't think it's I don't think it's avoidable to tell you the truth Mr. Phillips I've watched that landfill ever since it's been in existence and I particularly watched them fill the cell they're filling now it speeds up it slows down a lot of days they'll have trucks backed out on Jefferson Pike waiting to dump all the way to the top of the hill some days they'll have seven or eight waiting to dump they control that flow that's their game we don't we, we don't have any control on that I, by no means would I not believe or say I did not believe what they tell me, but I'm skeptical. I've watched a lot of shows. I've seen a lot of smoke screens in my life dealing with the general public and different businesses that I've dealt in, and this is one I'm kind of fear of. If we put this off, it's going to bite us. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. All right. Um, I, I just want to second uh, Steve's sentiments. He said it better than I. He and I have been dealing with this for a long time. Um, maybe we, some of you have forgotten that uh, Republic as a neighbor has not always been the best. Um, we are trying to change that. Uh, you know where the city stands. And uh, we need to go forward with the transfer station at today's dollar. At least like Chairman Dodd said, uh, we have in the budget this engineering, get that done, see what it's gonna cost. Uh, but the, the clock is ticking, don't get me wrong. It has been ticking. Uh, TDEC has the best information and I would trust TDEX information and when they say a couple of years I would believe two years yes they can throttle it but it's not to their best interest to throttle that inflow for us they don't owe us any favor for us to be a Rutherford County and or our friends in the South East Regional Solid Waste Committee, Cannon, others. We would have to come up with some big money, those four little counties, to equal what they bring in. That's what they would expect. They're a business group. We would have to match or better those fees. So for, for, for us to think that they would do that for us is <laughs> ridiculous. Rutherford only to pay a couple hundred bucks a ton then why, why would they do that uh, that's just makes no sense uh, the mayor's right I have sit in on negotiations with the public we have given them a list of things that we want from them including Rutherford Cannon and the other I, I can't remember now that, yeah the solid waste board our friends on the solid waste board uh, we gave them a list of demands and they went quiet uh, they meet in June to f figure out what the outcome of their expansion request is with the state of Tennessee. 
Their judgment day is in June. So they will know more about what's going to happen if they're going to expand on the Jefferson Pike side, which is where they don't want to go. They want the V. It sounds like some of you all are willing to do that. You want to add 30 more years of us being cavemen and bringing in other people's trash for another 30 years? That's not what this committee started out. That was not our mission. Our mission was to stop it. Go on our own, to be the best, to be somebody different. Quit being cavemen and burying trash. But we'll get to that when it's time to vote. All right, Bishop, I'm gonna bring you back up. You have one item in other business I'm gonna bring up so you can go home. That is a budget amendment request on general fund. So, Mayor, I'm going to let you and Bishop yep. explain to the committee what we have here in front of us. So, before we get to this, just um, so one final thing. Thank you, uh, Chairman Cush. But recently, I want to I want to just leave you this with this rhetorical question. Recently, Republic has made a significant investment in public relations into our community. They've been They've had Channel 5 up on the top of their hill. They've had, they've been, Mr. Clawson's been on every radio station he can get on. He has been in the newspaper. They are making a significant public relations push. I would suspect that's part of the initiative when he reached out to the commission. I would expect them to do no less. My question is, it's a rhetorical question, if they've got five or six or seven years, why are they doing that now? The budget request that we're asking for is linked to directly to the initiative of putting a transfer station out there. As you know, Landfield Road does not coincide exactly with, what's the other road there, Bishop, that's across? East Jefferson Pike. Well, East Jefferson Pike, it intersects, but it's, there's another road that it's lined up with. So what, what we need to do is there's a uh, three-phase utility pole right there that creates a Y right there next to our convenience center. The uh, Middle Tennessee Electric has ag agreed to move that pole east down Jefferson Pike. Antler Drive, sir. Thank you. Antler Drive. Thank you. And so what we need to do in anticipation of having 53-foot trailers, egress and ingress, talking to Greg Brooks, he says that we need two lanes exiting uh, Landfill uh, Road onto Jefferson Pike with one lane. And so we need to widen that intersection and extend back uh, for the appropriate traffic flow. What we're asking for is a budget amendment to move $50,000 to do the engineering and design and anticipation of uh, creating a much more friendly uh, intersection there at uh, Landfield Road, Antler Drive, and Jefferson Pike. So talk to us about the numbers, Bishop. So uh, this will be taking funds from the uh, the 101 346 which was the committed for public health, and it's the landfill emergency fund money that we used for engineering, planning, and designing. It's taking a uh, $50,000 from that fund, and it's moving it into the same fund location, the uh, 101 990 That's the, the other funds that we have for the landfill. It's where h &A is funded from from currently. The purposes of this funding will be to pay for uh, an engineering company to come out and do uh, site engineering of the, ex you know, including traffic study, everything that's required for uh, understanding that intersection and what it's going to look like for a, for a proposal that we can know how much it's going to cost uh, and what we're going to have to ask for when it comes time to, to put all of the eggs in the basket. Are we talking about next to the convenience center? Yes, sir. Do we have the authority to do this? To do, I, I mean, I, I think from a, to have an engineer come out there and do a site design and evaluation, yes, we have a authority to, for them to come out there and look at the land. Now, whether we construct it or not, that's another matter. If we, if we can't carry out the project, but we, we are making provision to do that. We will, have, we will not undergo engineering design of reconstructing of a intersection without the ability 
to implement that engineering and design as specified. So we're not going to spend the 50000 for the engineer until we find out if we have the authority to change the structure that's, that's of exactly the road. Correct. That's exactly correct. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, yes. Steve, you're because does uh, Republic own some of that frontage or, or what's the, what's your, explain to the public what you're talking yeah. about, please. Over the years, it's always said they did not own that road going to that landfill or that intersection. But in the last whatever, it's been determined that it's a easement. Cross Republic onto our property? Is that what you're right. saying? So that's the reason I was questioning, did we have the authority to change that intersection by not owning the land? And of course, we don't own the land where the convenience center sits either, if it happens to have to get over into that area. So that was my question reason. Really, the bottom line is you want to spend 50,000 bucks to get an engineering firm to look at uh, an intersection design and it's internal to your own budget. Yes, sir. All right. All right. After re reviewing those numbers and understanding the situation, do we have a motion up or down? Motion to approve by Commissioner Piercy. And we have a second by Chairman Dodd. All those in favor, please say aye. No. Oh, I'm sorry, we have to be on the roll. Mr. P? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. James? Yes. Mr. Dodd? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Mr. Piercy? Yes. Chairman Cush? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Bishop. All right, next time of business, uh, planning and engineering, Doug Mr. DeMossi. Chairman. Yes, sir. I had, a, I had a couple more questions over here. Okay. Uh, for Bishop, because uh, kind of got cut off earlier, but uh, traffic flow was mentioned before in the presentation, and it mentioned private and long haul. Private meaning private trash companies, not our residents going to this facility. That's correct. It would be uh, trash collection companies that collect waste that is located within Rutherford County to take to our transfer station for us to be able to dispose of it in a life facility. Okay, so private means private haulers, yes, not sir. private individuals. Okay, and we will be able, I, I think it, it was addressed, sort of, we will be able to, to have our recycle and what I call garbage at that transfer station. So the transfer station is designed to do uh, construction and demolition material as well as municipal solid waste material, which would both go to two different types of end of life facilities, um, whereas now they're currently going to one type of end of life facilities, but we will still continue to uh, have our, our recycling materials and have our contracts that we have and, and manage our recycling materials. There will be expandability should we wanna do something in the future. Um, we've got plenty of space to grow that in, but this current rendition is for uh, managing the, the two waste streams that we would be collecting and need to be disposing of. Okay, so that does not include recyclables. N no, there's no, I mean, hopefully we won't get recyclables at that center and we'll continue to collect them the way we do at our convenience centers and, and et cetera. Um, but I think in the future we'll be looking at ways to maximize our diversion through through the center. This is this would be step one in in what uh, what I think would be a, a long term plan for managing materials at the center. I guess for clarification I was I was trying to ask if we're gonna take our recyclables from say weekly road we are uh, compact them now. We're not gonna take them to the transfer station. No, sir. We'll take them. We'll continue to take them directly to their to the materials recovery facility um, of our choosing. But eventually, we could expand and start doing that. If if it becomes uh, cost effective and the best the best solution, I, I we would have the we have the space there to be able to grow there to be able to do that. All right. Thank you, Bishop. All right, Doug, Michael.
Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, if, uh, if I could uh, just make a suggestion, I think it'd probably be best if I go through my regular reports, we could let Ms. Bell go through her regular reports, right. and then we could come back and do the- Sounds good. Piece. Okay, very good. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well tonight. Uh, just have a couple of things for your consideration tonight. The first is the available lot inventory. Uh, you will see the PDF of this on your iPads. You'll see that the available lot inventory just kind of scooted right to the top of the sixth of nine pages there. Our total available lots at the end of uh, April is 955. This is down about 70 or so from last month. Didn't We had a pretty decent amount of activity. I know Ms. Bell will get into that in a, a little more detail with her report. Uh, we just didn't see very many plats get recorded this month. We saw a handful, but they were all smaller two, three lot subdivisions, but uh, nothing larger. So that's the reason this number did go down. So if there's no questions on that, I will go into our rezoning report. Uh, we do have one item for your consideration at next week's meeting. However, I will say that there is a, a little bit of uncertainty with this item, and I'll explain why. This item is from Blackman Baptist Church. They're asking, and they're, well, before I get into that, their property is located at 390 Brinkley Road. Uh, they are asking to rezone their property from the current RM, which is residential medium density, to institutional. That's a zone we created with the new zoning ordinance that we're currently under back in 2013. It's for larger community assembly, community education uses, uh, could be for healthcare facilities, things like that. Nothing retail related, nothing food or restaurant related, nothing like that. The reason they were asking was twofold. First of all, there was a charter school that uh, had originally made an agreement with the church to use their facility to operate for their first year. The charter school is also in the process of annexing and zoning some property into the city of Murfreesboro where they would build a permanent facility. Since the planning commission meeting until uh, tonight, the agreement with that charter school is no longer going to be used. So the church was still looking to possibly move forward with this as a, a rezoning so that they could uh, continue growing at that location. The way we handle community assembly uses, which are churches, includes churches and other similar facilities, there's three levels, small, medium, and large. You can have it by right in a residential zone up to 150 people based on the occupancy of the largest gathering area, which is usually the sanctuary, the main re meeting room. From 150 to 500, you're allowed in the residential zone, but by special exception. So you have to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals for approval for that. Anything above 500 would require you to have institutional zoning. The church's long-term plan is to stay at this facility. So again, at the time, this kind of killed two birds with one stone, so to speak. They were going to allow the school to be able to use the facility for a year, be zoned properly, and then when the school left, they would still have their zoning and could expand. There was a neighborhood meeting based on the results of the planning commission. They did ask that the applicant have a neighborhood meeting. That was last night. I was in attendance. Uh, Commissioner Trey Gooch was also there, who's the commissioner of that district. There was a lot of discussion about the institutional zoning and the comfort level of the people in the area, especially those that immediately surround it. And the suggestion was made that you know, if you can get by with the special exception and not change the zoning, they'd be more comfortable with that than actually moving forward with the zoning request to institutional. So the church has to vote on that. They will have a vote on that prior to our meeting next week. There is a chance that this may not be on the agenda. I will let you know prior to next week's meeting if that is the case. I know you like seeing me here and you like me when I'm giving our public hearings and everything like that, but you may have to do without me for a month. I'm sorry. But uh, I'll have a better idea moving forward here probably within the next few days. So. The Planning Commission did recommend approval of this by a vote of 9-4 and one against. Uh, most of the concerns really had to deal with the traffic being caused by the charter school during morning and afternoon, afternoon student drop-offs and things like that. But again, that's been taken off the table. So uh, this staff report really has, I mean, based on when I wrote it, it was accurate. Things have changed. So I just wanted to give you an update on that. So that's really the two items that I had tonight to discuss with you, the lot inventory and this. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. So the charter school is or is not associated with the church now? They were not, yeah, they, they were an independent from the church. They were gonna have an agreement with the church to use their facility, but they are no longer going to do that. All right, need a motion, well, any questions in need a motion for his report? 
Move to approve the report. Second. second. And a second from Commissioner Beersey. All those in favor? Those. Thank you. Thank Doug. you. And again, I'll come back for the uh, presentation when Ms. Bell's completed her report. All right, perfect. Um, building codes? Good evening, commissioners. How y'all doing? All right. So April, we issued a total of 355 permits. 99 of those were single family dwellings. Uh, as opposed to this month, or this time last year, uh, April of last year, we issued 74 single family dwellings with a total of 379 permits. Uh, for a total revenue in permit fees of $140,012. Anybody has any questions? I'll move on to school facilities tax and development tax. Uh, school facilities tax, we collected $542,777.50 in the month of April and $8,250 8, in development tax for a total revenue of, what is that? Okay, I can give you the cumulative. <laughs> a cumulative to this point this year is 4,372, as opposed to this time last year, we were at 4,462. So that's a difference of about 90,000. All right, average square footage uh, this month in all jurisdictions was 2,401 square foot for single family dwelling and 1,596 square foot for a townhouse. Say that one more time. Average square foot for a single family dwelling in all five jurisdictions was 2,401 square foot and a townhouse was 1,596 square feet. And if nobody has any questions on that one, I will move on to zoning enforcement. We had a total of 171 inspections for the month of April. That concludes my report. Motion Tanya. to approve the report. Second. Right. Uh, Tanya, do you, that 171 inspection report, is that kind of steady? That zoning enforcement, this time of year, we kind of pick up. We start to get tall weeds and grass and people out open storage and so it's yeah, on it picks the up during spring and summer. Thank you. I'm, I'm curious of what your, your four noise complaints were. Um, I'd have to look at that. I'm sorry. Right. I apologize. Right. I don't have those. All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. That Those reports carry. Tanya, thank you. All right. You guys uh, want to huddle and uh, come back and uh, let's talk about your fee presentation uh, in conjunction with Tanya and her building codes. And by the way, there is no number five tonight. There is no highway uh, department report all right well thank you good afternoon or good evening again uh we're going to continue the discussion that we started during our meeting last month where we presented specific options uh for new fees didn't have any figures at the time but during that meeting you did request that we do some analysis come up with some specific fee recommendations bring those to the Planning Commission, and then bring those here. So that is what we've done, and that's what we're gonna go through tonight. So assuming this works, and it does. So first thing we're gonna do is start with our planning and engineering fees. I'm not gonna go through the chart here. You've got this on your iPads as well. There's a PDF file on your iPads, because I know some of these are gonna be a little difficult to see on the big screens. But you'll see our current planning and engineering fees. These are effective uh, November 1st of 2021, so about a year and a half old. So I'm not gonna spend just a whole lot of time talking about those. What we ended up doing was taking a look at those fees and trying to determine some ways ultimately to make our department more self-sufficient than it is. So what we ended up doing is we took a look at all the fees that we charge and we started coming up with some options. And so what we've come up with for our fees, and there's several slides here, and again, they're on your iPads if you have issues seeing the, the big screens. 
I've got two charts here, two tables next to each other. One's got our current plat and plan fees and the other one's our proposed. So you can see what we're doing. We're looking at our preliminary plan. Essentially, we're, we're doubling a lot of things. Preliminary plan, our base fee would go from 500 to 1,000. We'd go from $100 per lot to 250, and that would be the same for major final plats. Those are plats that require road construction, utility construction, uh, rights of way dedication, things like that. Uh, drainage, you know, common detention areas, things like that. The minor plat fees, we would raise those from 150 to 250 for the base, and then 75 to 100 for the per lot fee. Now again, your minor plats are those things basically that are majors. Uh, they don't have any roads being constructed. They don't have any common drainage facilities, anything like that. So they don't require as much um, uh, work on them than as say a major would. And then our plat waivers, which this is something that we look at occasionally. If someone's asking for a, a waiver from the subdivision regulations. We look at right now, that's $50 for a waiver request. We're gonna look up that to 150. Those are for standalone waivers. There are times when we do review plats that we do come across a waiver that is needed. That's just part of the review process. We don't tack on an additional 150 or 50 right now on that. It's just part of the uh, review fee. These are for someone that wants to come in, ask for it before they go through the survey work of, of having it all all done and I can always go back to any of these so feel free to, to ask questions we can kind of go back and forth for site plans our current fee again is five hundred dollars base fee and then two cents per square foot and ten dollars per residential unit what we decided to do here was to up the base fee to 750 and rather than have a separate fee for non-residential area and residential units we just decided to keep it all square foot related and raised it from two cents to 10 cents per square foot. So that's going to be for anybody that comes in with any kind of a commercial building or any kind of townhome development, we would just go by square footage. We would not go by the number of units. The next slide deals with our zoning compliance forms. This is the beginning really of the building permit process. When somebody wants to take out a building permit to either build a new home on like an acreage tract, or if they're wanting to put an addition to their home, if they're wanting to add a pool or any other accessory structure, they come into our office and they're charged $50 regardless of what that is. What we're proposing to do, this is a fee that's really been like this since about 2007. Uh, what we're proposing to do is kind of break this down into two separate fees. One would be for any new principal residential structure, that means a new house, any addition or any accessory dwelling unit. Essentially what we're talking about is new living area. We would take that fee up to 250. Anything else, any kind of a detached accessory structure like a garage, a shed, a pool, anything like that, we would just raise it to $150 just because of the, the level of review that we do with those would be quite to the extent as it would be for a new living area. The next slide has to do with our rezoning fees. Right now we charge uh, 70, excuse me, $750 for a non-PUD rezoning fee, like the one we talked about a little bit ago, where the, uh, the church was looking to go from residential to an institutional use. Do you have a question, Mr. P? I do. Uh, I'd like to see this in my hand on a piece of paper. Could we have our secretary do that for us while we're looking at these? Uh, absolutely. Uh, if, if I may, um, I, because um, of this presentation and the possibility of an alternative, I was gonna do a handout um, and not that I've got with me, but I was gonna wait, but I'll be glad to hand that out if the commissioner likes. It's a piece of paper with this information on it. I'd like to see a handout. Sure, I, I can do that. I can do that now. The, the numbers I'm seeing, uh, I'm not happy with. Let's just put it that way. Well, th yeah, this is a proposal, and this was based on a conversation I had with Nick about what may be an alternative. Um, but I'd be glad to pass this out that, if that's successful. Now, I will say that the what he's going to pass out will have our current fees and then an alternate proposal that uh, we'll talk a little bit more about. What's reflected here is the same thing that went to the Planning Commission uh, a, week or, a week or so ago. So I'll just continue on as uh, Mr. Hennessy's passing this out. Uh, again, our current, you see our current fees on the left and our proposed fee for a non-PUD, we'd raise to 1,000. And then our base fee for our plan development, we'd keep at 1,000, but we would add in a per lot residential fee or a square footage non-residential fee. 
And then you see we also raised our Board of Zoning Appeal fees. Now the administrative appeals, I'll just say, uh, after looking at that, I wouldn't put just a whole lot of um, stock in, we're gonna get a lot of money out of that. Administrative appeals are whenever somebody wants to appeal a decision made by either myself or Ms. Bell to the Planning Commission in regard to interpretations of the zoning ordinance. Since I've been here, I think, you know, almost 17 years now, I think we've seen one. And so that, that's just for your information. So a couple of new fees that we do not currently charge. From a, the planning standpoint, I'm gonna turn over to Mike here in just a moment, and uh, he's going to go through some of the uh, construction review fees. Right now, again, we do the addressing for the unincorporated county. Whenever subdivisions are done or somebody needs an address, we're the ones that do that. We currently do not charge for that. Uh, we would charge $5 per address assigned. So if you have a 100 lot subdivision, I mean, you can do the math, $500. Uh, site plan subdivision plat reapproval. We do run into occasions where a site plan or a plat will expire after it's approved by the Planning Commission. Right now, we do not charge for reapprovals. What we'd propose is take the base fee from each of those categories, be it a site plan or a plat, and we would charge that as a reapproval fee to go back through the Planning Commission. And Mike, I will turn it over to you for construction fees. You can use that if okay. you want to. Thank you, Douglas. Um, so as far as construction review fees, um, currently our critical lot grading plan, these are typically individual lots that have sinkholes, steep slopes, any kind of uh, terrain issue that we need to have a detailed plan of what's going on. Currently we charge $150 per lot. We're looking to raise that to $250 per lot. Um, land disturbance fees, um, currently we have a, essentially a sliding scale uh, and it's based on the amount of land that we're looking at and a per cost fee um, for uh, the acreage. Uh, so what we looked at is how can we compare this to apples to apples uh, and we looked back and essentially what we were charging, we went through several scenarios, we were charging about $85 per lot. Um, and what we would like to do is do a residential per lot fee of $250 per lot. And for commercial, would we would have a, a flat $1,000 base fee and then $250 per acre. So we're trying to simplify things, everything that we can, uh, get it on a per lot basis if we can or per acre for commercial. Uh, construction plans review, we started charging uh, these back December of, uh, what was it 20, two years ago, one, one and a half years ago. Yeah. Um, so, and we've, you know, been happy with that, but, uh, like I said, we're trying to simplify, get everything to a per lot fee. Again, it, uh, we looked at several scenarios and we were, uh, collecting about $85 per lot for the construction plans. These are the detailed nuts and bolts of how you're gonna build the roads, the, the stormwater systems, uh, the detention ponds and all that to have a new subdivision. Uh, and we're gonna look at that at a um, $250 per lot fee. Uh, and some things that we've never charged before in the past, uh, the last line is construction inspection. So this is where we've got to send inspectors out in the field, make sure the roads are built correctly so they're not going to fail in a few years. Um, we, you know, they, they look at, at the stormwater networks to make sure that they're installed correctly. Again, so when these items are turned over to the county, these are uh, quality products so that it won't be uh, something that the highway department will have to start fixing uh, in, in a short period, this will last a long, long time. And then also we have a fee for as-builts and lot releases. So um, an as-built record drawing is essentially a requirement where the um, developer has to go back out, send his surveyors, do a resurvey of what's been constructed and this has been very beneficial to us. We can see a lot of errors and things that need to be corrected. You might not be able to pick up just looking at it um, that you know the slope is wrong or, or it's too flat or the ditch holds water in particular spots. Uh, so we, we've instituted a, a as-built record drawing. This, this new fee would be 
towards the end of the project um, before we release lots to the building codes department for for new um, new lots to be house, uh, for building permits to be issued so that's uh, essentially fifty dollars per lot for that okay so um, Douglas and I put together some cost comparisons. Uh, we looked at various size developments. We have a 200 lot subdivision, a 25 lot subdivision, a small minor five lot subdivision, a 10,000 square foot building, and a 200 lot plan unit development. And you can see on the screen, we've got our current fees, um, so for a, a preliminary plan, we've got a $500 base fee and $100 per lot. And for a 200 lot subdivision, we currently will collect $20,500. And what Doug had mentioned before that we are proposing to bump the base fee up to a thousand uh, base fee and then $250 per lot. And that would uh, more than double uh, what we collect to 51,000. And likewise, with the the uh, 25 foot lot subdivision, currently we're collecting about uh, 3,000, and then we would jump up to uh, 7,250. And then the minor, you can see, it's got a slight increase uh, from 525 to 750, and then a uh, commercial site plan building with a 10,000 square foot building. Uh, much like the transfer station we're looking at, we would collect $700, and then with the new fees in place, we would collect uh, $1,750. And that 10 cents per square foot, that helps cover the fire marshal's fee for review, um, the preliminary building codes review. We all meet together and have a review of, of those site plans and, and these this increased fee will help cover that cost. Um, it's, it's also the site plan is essentially the construction drawings for this new commercial building. You there won't be a separate set of construction drawings like there will be for a subdivision. So the site plan essentially is uh, a preliminary construction plans and the final all together. Um, and then for the the 200 lot rezoning app, uh, application, we've got right now a $1,000 base fee, and we would uh, carry that $1,000 base fee on, but we would tack on at $10 per dwelling unit. And so the fees we currently collect, $1,000 would, would jump to $3,000. Thank you, Mike. Uh, just a couple more, uh, just some cost comparisons, just to give you an idea. We're gonna go into this in a little more detail, uh, even before and after uh, Ms. Bell's part of the presentation. But you can see uh, some cost comparisons here. Uh, Mike had just discussed the, uh, the cost comparisons there of the different subdivisions. This is a cost comparison here of the different land disturbance and construction review types. Uh, I'll just call your attention to the very last uh, column there where it says total. Uh, you can see the C is current and the P, excuse me, the P is proposed. So they're going from 11,500 to 25,000 for a 45 acre 50 lot subdivision, 6,000 to 17,000 for one that's 20 acres and 35 lots. And then a commercial you can see goes to, well, 3,500. You can kind of see based on the proposed fee from 2,000 to, uh, well, that's, that's a new fee. So uh, three, there was not a current to, to really base it on just the 2,000. So. Uh, this kind of breaks it down just a, a little bit more for three different subdivisions. And these are the ones that we're gonna talk a little bit more about after Ms. Bell's presentation. But just to give you an idea of the current fees versus proposed fees of the total plat review costs per lot. And that includes all those items that you see there, preliminary plan, construction drawing, land disturbance, et cetera. Uh, you can see that the total goes from 5,400 to a little uh, right below 16, I'm sorry, 15,900 for an 11 lot subdivision. Uh, you can see for a 50 lot subdivision, it goes from about 450 to about 1300. 
and then the final one, the 218 lot subdivision, and incidentally, these are all based off of real life subdivisions that we've looked at. Uh, that last one you can see goes from about 77,500, roughly just under that, to a little over 275,000 for the review fees. So that just gives you uh, just an overview of the proposal we brought before the Planning Commission uh, in our last meeting. And with that, I will turn it over to Tanya for building codes. Okay. Hi, again. All right, so, uh, oh, it died. It didn't die, it went back, oh, city works. It went to a different screen. It says, sorry, I'll use this. That's okay. That's okay. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so the slide that's currently up there um, is the same slide that I showed you last month when we talked about this. This is our current fee schedule for uh, Rutherford County. Uh, we issue our building permits, as I explained to you last month, based on the square footage and the use of each area within the home. So on the left-hand side, um, you'll see it's divided up into finished living area, unfinished area, garage area, porch and deck area, and then it gets into remodel and um, finish ex for different permits, uh, finish expandable areas, moved in dwelling, storage buildings, and that, that kind of stuff. All right, so that's just giving you an overview of what we currently do again. All right, so this next slide is, um, when I come to you guys every, every month and we discuss school facilities tax, I always tell you what the average square foot of a single family dwelling is in Rutherford County and it typically tends to hover around the 2500 mark. So I did all my comparisons and all my research based on a 2500 square foot home because it was just easier to stick to one, um, one size home and doing comparisons. So I researched, um, as I told you last month, 11 different jurisdictions uh, around Middle Tennessee and using a 2,500 square foot home with a 500 square foot garage and then 100, 200 square foot of porches and decks. And you can see there that Rutherford County is second to um, the bottom in these fees next to the city of Murfreesboro is 1,067. We are at 1,087 and then the other nine is above us with the highest being at $2,304 for the city of Franklin. All right, so at the very bottom of that page, I took the average of these, um, these permit fees. The average of all 11 of these permit fees was $1,750 for this size home. So that's what I used my basis to increase our permit fees. That's the number that I used. So in the next, this is the same screen that I showed you last month um, where I researched the same 24 to 2600 square foot homes that were for sale in Rutherford County and that's where I came up with the average sales price of 522,000 with an average price per square foot of 208. All right, so this screen is um, the proposed suggested uh, fee increase for building permits in Rutherford County. Um, about half of the square foot, or excuse me, half of the uh, jurisdictions that I researched use a flat fee to achieve their permit fee. Um, all of them use some sort of valuation of the home. So they base it on the square footage or the valuation of the, of the dwelling itself. That's how the permit fee is, is calculated. Um, the, the lowest one was 35 cents a square foot, the highest one was 70 cents a square foot. So that median, the median value that I just, a permit fee that I just um, described in the previous screen, screen, the $1,760, equates to 55 cents a square foot, which is the median, so that's where I started. Um, I feel like uh, the median permit value in, uh, for Rutherford County is a good place to start. So $55 a square foot would achieve a 1,750 square foot, excuse me, $1,750 permit for a 2,500 square foot home. Um, 50, I'm sorry, 55 cents, yeah, 55 cents, sorry. 
Um, I did also, uh, several of the uh, jurisdictions that I checked into did a sliding scale uh, based on the square footage. They did um, a sliding scale on the flat fee, increased it a couple of cents per square foot for as you increase in size for home. So I put that in there as an example of what what is out there just for your review. Uh, 52 cents up to 2,000 square foot structure. Uh, 2,000 to 3,500 square foot would be 55 cents a square foot. 3,500 to 5,000 square foot at 58 cents a square foot. And then 5,000 square foot and above would be 59 cents a square foot. Now those fees um, only apply to new construction. Um, the, the rest of the fees, the remodel, moved in, everything beneath that, the remodel, the moved in dwelling, storage, garage, storage building, garage, pole barns, the items that a, an existing homeowner might come into our office and get a building permit for, a, an existing someone who lives in the home already and they want to come in. I did not increase those by the same margin. I went to my budget in 2016, which is when these fees were established, the current fees are established, and I looked at my budget to see what kind of increase, administrative increase, I had incurred in my budget in my department um, over the last eight years, seven years. And that equated to about 30% when you look at um, gas for the trucks when we go out and do inspections, the trucks themselves, administrative staff. Um, supplies, just anything that I use in my office. So I didn't increase the these permits as much for that reason, because these are existing citizens and they shouldn't have to incur the same increase as new construction would. So the um, the remodel dollars per square foot, the 5671 to 74 is where that comes in. That's about 30 percent, by 29, 30 percent. And I actually applied that to everything, all of the flat fees. I used that same 30% in all of the flat fees, the same fees that um, we talked about in the uh, first screen and last month. The, there's three permits there that have two stars beside them, and those denote um, new permits. So currently we do not issue a mechanical permit and when I was doing this research, 100% of the jurisdictions that I researched issue a separate mechanical permit. We typically just included ours in our building permit or just said it was included in the building permit. Um, solar panels, uh, we do when we, when someone issue, or when someone installs solar panels in their home, we do a review, we have them do an engineered design of the roof system to ensure that the roof system will, will hold the load of the new solar panels. So we review that for them and currently we do that at free of charge. So um, that solar panel installation would be uh, a permit that we don't currently issue. And then also a retaining wall, if someone was doing a retaining wall without, without it being associated to new construction. So if it was being done to hold back uh, dirt or if they were installing a pool and it was being done to install, to hold back dirt for a pool, uh, we don't currently issue a retaining wall permit. Most other jurisdictions do, it is covered in the code. Um, that concludes uh, residential. Does anybody have any questions on that page? I know it's a little, a lot of information on that page. Does anybody have any questions before I move on to commercial? No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so commercial. Um, I did say, uh, tell you last month that we had, in, I came to you in September of 2020 and increased our commercial um, fee chart uh, from, it hadn't been uh, increased since about 2006, I believe. Um, I took, I went and looked at the most recent table um, that was most recently updated in February of 2023 and it is about 6.5% over what the, the current table that we have. So I propose that we increase um, to the most recent table. And uh, our, I will get back to the, the public safety building here in just a second. But for uh, plans reviews for commercial, we do a plans review on every single commercial project that we issue a permit for. Um, so I, uh, currently our minor reviews are $125 and that would be for a, um, a, a building, um, like a shale that they're going to later come in and build out 
or an addition, a small addition to an existing building, uh, an existing commercial building permit, or excuse me, building, um, I suggest that we increase that to 250. And I would like to define a minor for, this, for the purposes of this fee as uh, a building shell only or an addition to an existing commercial building of no greater than 10% of the existing square footage. So anything over 10%, an addition of anything over 10% of the existing square footage would go to a larger uh, plan review fee. All other plans of use a percentage of the permit cost, and my suggestion would be 20% of the permit cost on the plan of use fees. And the reason I, I say that, I know that that sounds a lot, um, but most of our, our commercial building permits are not that much, and I'll get into that in just a second. Um, a substantial amount of time um, is spent on the, the plan of use that we do for these larger commercial projects. Um, to include, we have discussions and meetings with the architects, the engineers, um, the builders, and additionally, they also include include a review by the county fire marshal. And uh, they don't, their department doesn't have any way to recoup those, the fees for those or the, the, um, the fees for that service. So um, my suggestion would be 20% of the permit cost. So a, um, just a, a note that I wanted to throw out there. Recently we did a, we don't have very many commercial projects in Rutherford County. Now they're getting, they're getting more. We are getting more and more of them and, and the introduction of step systems and stuff obviously opens that up to even more. So um, the fees in a commercial project for building codes is, is hard to compare because it really depends on how the building's constructed. If it's a metal building, if it's a, um, two by four method construction, if it's a steel building, if it's a timber frame building, and what size it is and what the use is for. It, all of that, all of those variables come into play when it comes to um, calculating the valuation of it. But um, as you all know, the Rockville Public Health and Safety Center, the public uh, health building that's out on Highway 99, we had to uh, obtain a building permit from the city of Murfreesboro for that building. And uh, we didn't issue a building permit because it's a county building and it didn't make sense to move, take funds from one hand and put it in the other. So um, had, we, had we have issued a permit for that um, building under our current fee structure, our current commercial fee structure, that building permit would have been 3,812. We had to get a permit from the city of Murfreesboro and their permit cost us $27,000. I don't know. Um, they do theirs based on the valuation of the building. So obviously uh, that building was um, an expensive building, but I just kind of wanted to throw that out there for a comparison. All right, that concludes my um, presentation. I will let Doug step back in. Thank you. And just to kind of uh, give a, just a complete overview of looking at costs per lot when you consider the planning and engineering costs and also the building codes. The last three slides uh, do that. These are the three same three scenarios that we looked at uh, a little earlier in the presentation, except we added in the uh, building permit fees as well as the school's facilities tax. And we wanted to compare that uh, to one of our adjacent counties being Wilson County to kind of see how we stacked up with them. And you can see there's some differences on these slides. There are some fees they charge that we don't. There are some that we do that, that they don't. But you'll see the biggest difference is the fact that they have that $5,000 development tax, whereas we have the school's facilities tax. So with, you can see kind of looking at the chart with our current fees, you're looking at with the school's facilities tax and building permit fees, you're looking at about just a little under $4,100 per lot. With our proposed fees, that's closer to $5,700. And then comparing that to Wilson County, uh, you're looking at theirs is 7614 uh, The 50 lot subdivision, again, you can kind of see the rough comparisons there. The, the amounts really don't change just a whole lot. A little over 4,000 under our current fees, 55 and no, fives across the board there for the uh, proposed fees. And then Wilson County again, 7,500. So you're looking roughly at about a $2,000 difference between what we would propose and what Wilson County currently charges. And then the same again for the 218 lot subdivision. Uh, you'll see that uh, you know the as the as the amounts of lot, the number of lots go up, the numbers per lot goes down just a little bit. 
Uh, but you can see it's again right about four thousand dollars under our current fees a little over fifty five hundred for our proposed fees and then comparing that to wilson county is about seventy five hundred forty three dollars so that's a whole lot of information to throw at you uh, i'm sure you have questions and we'll be happy to answer those questions to the best of our ability a uh, quick question it, it, I asked this question at planning, so this will be familiar with Jeff and Jeff. This this proposed column in the center, will you will you back up a slide? Yes. Uh, yeah. You, I mean, okay. Uh, I'll just use the 50 lot if that's all right. I can use any of the three that you want. Uh, okay. Yeah. R regardless. Um, the 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 current is on the left your Correct. proposed is in the center that's right and then at the very bottom is your cost per lot so four thousand versus fifty six hundred is what your proposed increase is that is correct and what what i found um uh alarming i guess was at planning this this is what you need to get solvent might be the incorrect word, but this is to get you in operating neutral at this point, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. This doesn't, even with these proposed changes that we're looking at, it doesn't get us completely there, but it gets us almost there. It's, it's right now I think we're about a third from what we normally make. This gets us almost equal, but if you add in storm water, it's a, it's a little short, but, uh, but to answer your question, essentially yes. Okay, does. and these, these proposed numbers do not take into effect any new personnel needs, equipment needs, tools, training, anything like that. Is that correct? That's yes, sir. That's our current budget. Yes, sir. This is your current budget. Yes. All right. Um, uh, okay. So I, I, we need to increase those. Uh, The, la the last time we increased these fees, I think you said was December of 21. Yeah, about a year and a half. I think it was November, okay. actually, but yes. Uh, I, I, I do remember, and, I, and if you want to pull the video, I, re I remember sitting here in this spot and asking all three of you if the increase at that time was enough because I said your number sounded too low. And were you sure that that was enough? Because now was the time to add some more if you wanted to do that. We settled on the numbers we did in December of 2021, and lo and behold, they weren't enough. So here's my concern. Price is what you pay, right? Value is what you get for the price that you pay. Engineering, to me, is understaffed. Uh, I, I get complaints, and I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, I'm just stating facts. I get complaints from developers about the turnaround time for plan check and plan recheck. It takes a couple of months to check, a couple of months then again to get them rechecked. One big project that's going on right now in the county, and I'm gonna emphasize big project, takes up a lot of staff's time because we have a lot of big projects going on right now. And without the proper staff, we have a developer that is waiting six months to get plans checked the first time, let alone sent back to get them rechecked for initial comments. So we need more staff, which to me says these proposed fees are not enough if they do not have new staff um, cooked into them. Uh, I, I know that there has been discussion about getting your groups in a better facility, in a better office, 
that is more organized, easier to manage staff, and that is in the old Limeball Library. That will take some cost and expenses to get that renovated to do that. Those costs is part of doing business and I think that those fees should be raised because that is part of doing business in your department. So I'm gonna suggest, and I'm gonna shut up and listen to the rest of you, because this is not my dog and pony show, but I think we certainly need to raise uh, or have an alternate to those proposed fee schedules that this group has put a lot of time and effort in because when we did this in 21, it was not enough. We're doing this again just to get kind of neutral. And Doug's already suggested we still may be a, bit, a little bit off. And I'm saying we need more personnel because I'm tired of developers calling me and saying, hey man, can you push Hughes? Because we're waiting six months to get our, our drawings looked at and we got to order materials we've ordered, we heard today about equipment taking 14 months well a developer or contractor is not going to order building materials until county has signed off on the, the material on the plans so again I'm not throwing these kids under the bus it's just when you're doing a lot of plan review with a few people on staff this is the life we're in so that is, that is my soapbox. So let's open it up to the discussion. Chairman Phil. Just to add to that soapbox, we're constantly running behind. Constantly. And some of us are tired of that. Uh, the taxpayer is supplementing the cost of our planning department. And, and it at least needs to be a break-even situation such as most of our fee officers are. Um, plus the, the fact that planning has been in uh, the old Goldstein's building for as many years, and, and, and it's been a, a, a many years, but as many years as I can remember, and there is an update in the needs of that department as far as facilities are concerned uh, in the near future whatever the near future is, two years, five years, somewhere down the road, there's going to be that added cost of updating the facility that they're working out of. So that's even on top of the additional personnel uh, that's coming along. Um, I think the mayor has asked um, uh, the planning department, and this isn't coming out of planning, by the way. This is coming from the mayor's office and the commission. The mayor has asked uh, to compare us uh, with someone that is comparable, that has uh, a, a similar staff size, also a, a, a similar growth percentage, although they're not as we big thought. as we are, <laughs> but, but a similar growth percentage, uh, and, and uh, come up with something that's comparable. And I believe that's what this uh, spreadsheet is right here, if the mayor would care to comment on that. Yeah, so um, as this committee knows, this, this, this idea first came to this committee. Um, it was referred to planning. Uh, between this, the first time this issue about um, do we wanna look at adjusting fees uh, from the time it left this committee for the first time and went to planning, you know, I've been speaking with Doug and Mike and Tanya several times, several meetings over at their place and at my office and just to make sure that this committee had all the numbers that it needed to make a, a good and informed decision. And we used the template of Wilson County uh, as just as a, as a model because we wanted to make sure that uh, we were consistent within our region. And then as we, as, as so as, and then as we got through constructing the budget, which we will introduce Thursday night, our proposed recommendation for the departments, you know, I, within the 22-23 budget year, as Doug has said, uh, Mr. Chairman, we were still a bit short in his department. We were okay in, in Tanya's department, but short in Mike and Doug's department. And so, you know, one of the recommendations 
I, I'm going to make is a, a, an additional staff person in uh, Mike's department, and I'll talk about that on Thursday night and the reason for that. But also, you accurately, Mr. Chairman, point out that the facilities that they're working in are in a state of disrepair at the Goldstein Building. And so that is something in the near future, I'm hoping within two to three years or less, we're going to remedy. And you're correct. Um, the uh, chairman is correct about identifying the Lime Ball Library as a suitable facility for us to potentially move not just uh, Doug and Mike's and Tanya's department, but also the Election Commission. And so we've talked to uh, Murfreesboro about that. And so we're, we're kind of working on that, headed in a very positive direction. But you're right, if, if we're going to make, if we're going to allow these departments to function uh, without being a burden, which the, all these departments function within the context of growth. That's what they do. And if the Rutherford County taxpayer is going to subsidize the operation of these departments, we need to be able to quantify that. I think we can move beyond that like other counties have and allow these departments to function and exist from the fees that they generate that are necessary with it as it relates to growth. So what I did is I asked Doug to create, and I think you and I shared this, uh, Mr. Chairman, to create an alternative list that even expanded beyond that. And, and all that was do is, is to give you as much information, this committee, as much information as you needed to make a rational, informed decision. Whatever you decide, I'm going to support. But I do think there's a great deal of room for us to um, have all three of these departments be financially self-sufficient. And I think that's something we ought to move toward. I'm sorry, let me see if I can uh, understand this maybe a little bit more clearly. The spreadsheet that's up there, the 50 lot subdivision, um, is uh, uh, current and then the proposed break-even point with the Planning Commission. Uh, 4,500, and then currently what Wilson County has is 7,500. But on this little sheet that we passed out here, if we were to implement that as an alternative, that bottom line for Rutherford County proposed would go from 5,555 up to 75. Hundred bucks, or slightly over. That's correct. Seventy-five hundred yes, bucks. That's correct. So, if if we were to adopt this, then that bottom line would make us almost identical, slightly below what Wilson County is is charging, in essence, per lot. Per lot, yes, sir. And I'll just run through this. I mean, it's it's fairly self-explanatory. But the current fees, of course, and this is all Rutherford County. Uh, that first column, there's all of our current fees. The proposed fees are the ones we went. That was our primary presentation that we did, the one we made to the Planning Commission, and then what we started with here. That last category is the alternative fees, and I highlighted the ones that were changed. So most of them stayed the same, uh, but you'll see the ones that we did, uh, there were several we did highlights, and those are the ones that did increase. Uh, but you're correct, uh, Mr. Chairman. The, the fee, basically what we're looking at, if you were to look through these three scenarios that we put up here, the middle column, if we updated it with these numbers, they'd be much closer to the 7,500, the Wilson County numbers than, than they are right now. Yes. The comments that came out of uh, planning, Mr. Chairman, uh, dealt with Doug presenting to the planning department what he needed to continue to operate not in a deficit. I'm not saying totally in the black, but get out of the red to some degree. And that's what the planning department adopted. But there was also discussion at the planning department that the commission would be looking at adding to those things for future growth, future expansion as it relates to facilities that are needed and uh, just the cost of operating. Uh, so what the Planning Commission recommended was that break-even point uh, that's on the proposed fees. And uh, there was also some discussion that the Planning Commission doesn't need to be getting into the other things and that should be up to the full commission through the Public Works Department. So that's where we are right now. And all of these things is not coming from the Planning Department. All of these numbers are coming out of the Planning Department as requested by county government, whether it's the mayor 
or the county commission. So if anybody wants to point a finger at Doug, they're not pointing at the right person. We ask him and his department to put this information together. So bottom line is this, this chart, once again, that was put out, uh, if we um, adopted the proposed fees, uh, we're looking at uh, an increase from 4,000 bucks to 5,500 bucks. Uh, but if we were to adopt the alternative fees um, that uh, the mayor has asked that we look at in comparison to Wilson County, we would go from 4,000 bucks up to 7,500 bucks. So uh, th I think those are the choices that we need to make and probably we need to, uh, we need to make them as quickly as possible as get us through this budget process. And with regard to the timing, I, I, I thought the timing was convenient uh, for this discussion, given that obviously we're going to have a new fiscal year begin July 1, and it was, uh, you know, the thought in mind out of the office and in conversation with some of the members here that that would be the implementation date. If for whatever you decide to ratify and approve, the start date would be July 1. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. So our fee increase would equate to Wilson County's $5,000 a lot impact fee. And, and help me walk through it. Just, so they're running their department on a shoestring. What do they use in their $250,000 impact fee for on a 50 lot subdivision? Is it going to general fund schools, general fund? It's not funding their planning and engineering. General fund. And we're going to increase an equal amount and fund our planning and engineering? It just seems like we're our planning and engineering is exceedingly higher in income with this proposal than the, our comparison county. You, anybody with me? Let, let me add one caveat. As we looked, Wilson County came up in conversation because A, it's a neighboring county. We thought it was at a similar growth pattern. Um, when we went to our legislative group, remember a month or two ago, and asked for some help, uh, there was discussion about William or Wilson County with the $5,000, and we asked for $5,000 because that was kind of the, quote, comfort number that the legislative body thought that they could pitch. Well, what we found out was that Wilson County has about the same staff as these three standing over here, but we do five times more plans and, and uh, permits come through our office than Wilson County does. So we thought their growth was similar to ours. We are growing at a rate five times faster in terms of new homes and new roofs. So we're doing five times more work with the same amount of people. But that kind of diverts from your question, but I just wanted well, you to understand. It, it, it's the helping me make a comparison. Me. They, okay. Wilson County has a $5,000 per lot development tax yeah. and yes. funding their general fund. And we're seeking to equal, equal their average per lot cost just to fund our planning and engineering. Your center of planning and engineering does five times more work. I can, that, that helps. Yes. Second question, what is the, so this gross revenue anticipated at 7,000 a lot average on a 50 lot subdivision and, and the corresponding 7,500 per lot, I assume on the 218, Commissioner Phillips, all, the, all these ratios stay the same. Within dollars. So the gross revenue anticipated from this increase equates to your current budget that the county is supplementing through general funds with a bump, with, with a bump. 
well, that's what led to the discussion in the first. But, but, but the center solvent, column, I guess. The yes. center column, let me go back. The center yes. column at 5,500 a lot average on both of these scenarios. That gets us roughly to, your to our budget. To, yes, roughly. Yeah. And I, 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 will, I, I, I want to say that gets us roughly to our budget for budget year 22. 23. Correct. Without uh, additional people, the scenario of yeah. subdivisions are slow. Yeah. Exactly. Are sl not, not, and so, and so, what? Where the third column came in that Chairman Phillips is referencing is okay. He, and and I was challenged. Just okay. Well, what about this budget year coming up? You are proposing st stormwater individual, and again, we'll talk about that on Thursday night and the need for that individual. And you, we've got costs coming to upgrade the facilities in the next two to three years, i.e. line ball library, how do we calculate that? And so it was uh, based on those conversations that I then reached out to Doug, Mike, and Tanya. I said, give me an alternative solution that is a little more forward thinking in response to Chairman Cush's question of a year and a half ago, is this going to be enough? This, this addresses the current budget year, which is going to end in about a month and a half, but what happens next year? So yeah. I'm just trying to be a little more proactive and give you guys those choices. Uh, agree. Uh, I, I get the $2,000 a lot bump based on this spreadsheet. Uh, what's your current budget? Uh, planning take and engineering right now is right about 1.6, 1.7. Now, if you add in stormwater, it's another two to three, 300,000. So roughly I'll call it two million. Two, yeah. And yours, Tanya? Three point five, three point five total, total. and, and the well, revenue from this is three point five plus a bump of uh, again I don't the revenue course, the fifty five hundred dollars yeah. a lot is a three point five million dollar anticipated gross revenue from that structure the fifty five yeah and understand as and we I think we all realize this but obviously we're not going to see all that money on the front end uh, you know preliminary plan comes in. It goes through the process. It takes a month or two to go through the process. Then come the construction drawings. That takes time to go through. They may not actually start constructing and getting final plats until year two, three, four. So sure. yeah, we're not seeing this on the front end. Understand, and I understand you have to have a narrative. You have to pick scenarios. Right. You, uh, I get that, and the dollars may not. Yeah, and there's no and there's no ability to grandfather in either. I want to I, I want to make that real clear. Once a a plat or a development or a, building perts been issued and approved, you can't go back and claw that back. We don't have the ability to do that, obviously. So there's certain things that are in the pipeline within the existing fee structure that's going to stay there at that fee structure. How much uh, increased revenue does this achieve? Um, your, your, your current budgets combined are 3.5. Uh, what is the gross revenue anticipated from this increase or how much money by you funding yourselves is going into the general fund? Well, all the money we make in our department goes into the general fund. How much it's money beyond your self-sufficiency? If you're going to become self how much have we supplemented you in years past? Is there, a, how, many million, how many dollars is this generating that won't go to pay for, how much have we been supplementing you? That's my question. How much is the the development business going to put into the general fund that's going elsewhere? Right. Currently, I would say our budget, at, with our current numbers, we're probably about a third of what our budget is. Now, I'll be upfront with you, uh, Mr. Dodd. The I didn't have a chance to see what the total was based on this. You know, we just came up with this today, this afternoon, so I haven't had a chance to run all the numbers. But uh, that's something I can probably figure out pretty quickly. But I don't have that figure for with me. I apologize. And, and you know, th it makes a great deal of sense. Uh, and I anticipate we're going to expect a, a motion and a vote on this tonight. So I'm going to have to spend a little time on it. I, I assume we're going to want. Uh, I anticipate a motion coming. So. Uh, I'm going to need that number, and Mike may be working on it. Well, in the 20, excuse me. In the 22-23 budget year, we're supplementing Doug and Mike's department by almost a million dollars. And uh, building and codes. I'm sorry. If you would, they're, they're about building codes is about break even. 
Uh, so this is uh, this is going to generate a, a million dollars to the general fund that's not earmarked for planning and engineering. Is that? No, that's not correct. That's not what we're saying at all. Everything they go goes to the general fund, but our point is prior that any excess goes to the general fund. We're right. not anticipating excess, but we're trying to make this department somewhat self-sufficient so before they turn any excess to the general fund, they're going to meet their budget requirements. Okay, l let me try to, to restate it. So we're increasing the funds to make them self-sufficient. That'll generate about a million dollars that we would have heretofore supplemented their department. That's correct. So that, I'm just so there's a that's, there's that's that'll supplement that shortfall. Their fees go up a million dollars. Those fees will not have to come out of the taxpayers' dollars because they're coming out of the users' dollar. It's a great pay for service. Am I not correct? If this is approved, then there will be an additional million dollars in our tax roll that we can use elsewhere because we're not using it there because they're self-sufficient. So the, to answer your question in a nutshell, yes. Um, all of their money isn't earmarked for planning engineering. Um, it, it doesn't work that, you know, in the general fund, their general fund expense and their fees general, you know, generate that. So to give you some exact dollar amounts, uh, because of kind of what you were asking, um, and I'm giving you FY22 because we, that's what we have for final audited numbers there for FY22. So we'll start with building in codes. Um, the actual expenditures of building in codes in FY22 was $1,327,598. So very close to what you, the number you read. Building permits generated in FY22 was $1,386,862. So we were right at breaking, I mean, they were like, Thirty to fifty thousand dollars covering that. If you, if you wanted to kind of compare the, the expenses to that, um, the total net loss um, was, was, depending on what you include and which fee you include, was anywhere from seven hundred fifty thousand to a million dollars. Was the fees they generate to pay for all three of those offices combined, and that being building and codes, planning and engineering, and stormwater. But to answer your question, in theory, if this if this fee increase was to generate an additional million dollars, that would go into our general fund pot of revenue. So yes, um, if our budget was balanced, if the general fund budget was balanced, and this generated a million dollars, then yes, it would free up a million dollars to spend somewhere else that that you wanted to. Yes. And the additional two thousand dollars per lot. Can you? take a swag at what it would generate that's not being consumed by planning and engineering and building of codes. So so I will tell you I've generated the budget you'll see Thursday night is, is not based on these. Um, I believe an email that I saw from Doug thought it was anywhere from a million and a half to two million dollars in additional fee generation. I'm looking at Doug to see if that was if my recollection is is right. Now I want I want to point out one thing because we're, we're looking at a lot of fees here Keep in mind, our school facilities tax doesn't go to the general fund. So when we're looking at this cost per lot, I just want to make that so somebody doesn't think that their school facilities tax is going yeah, to the general and, fund. And, it's and I'm in support, mm -hmm. but if you give us money, we'll spend it. I mean, you no, no, new I just money, wanted we'll to spend look, new money. We're looking at fees on here, offsetting their apartment. Those are not um, in the calculation of covering their costs because they can't be. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear. The, the, the the, from 4,000 current to 7,500 is going to generate a million and a half or, or two million anticipated. They're going to use a million, the rest of it's going into other purposes. And that's based on current development and growth projections, which may or may not be turn out to be true, obviously. It, and I have not run those numbers for the budget. I, I just wanted, that was the, I think their initial estimate based on current uh, building growth. Phil, I've got some numbers, and I'm going to apologize to Michael because as I was ciphering, he was talking, and he may have given you these numbers or given you a ballpark, so I may be double dipping here. But here's what I did. These, these two yellow lines that are highlighted, which if you, if you take the alternate of 750 versus the proposed, that's $500 per lot. Agreed? Okay. With a $1,000 base fee. What Doug just told me was on the preliminary plans, item one, 
okay? We did 16 uh, different preliminary plans for a, with a total of 1,335 lots. So if you do that math at 16 times 1,000 plus $500 times 1,335 lots, that would have given you, that would have given you uh, 667,500 dollars on item two that's highlighted as final plats lots major. We did 21 of those with a total of 767 lots. So 21 times 1,000 plus 500 times 767 is 404. Thousand five hundred dollars. So add those together, you you get roughly one million three hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars of extra revenue off of this last. If we had those fees in play this year, we would have had an extra million three. Did that help answer your question? Okay. Yes. So pay for a new engineer at what, 130,000 a year plus insurance? Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm and hoping to add money to the general fund, not just to make themselves sufficient. I think this is an opportunity think, to I add money to the general fund for supporting other costs, debt service, whatever. And it sounds like we're getting there. This is adding some money to the general fund above and beyond their current cost. Yes, sir. I think, and I think and we, even with their bump, Yes. We, this and, and it sounds like we could probably find that number at several hundred thousand dollars a year that they will not consume even if they're in their anticipated growth. I appreciate you saying that because now I understand the nature of your question and I didn't and I did not understand I thought I was answering your question, but obviously I wasn't because I didn't understand what you were driving at. So the answer to your to that original question you posed to me, what I'm looking for in budgets going forward is as much flexibility as we can have. And so right now when we have departments in, in, the, in the red, we have no flexibility, right? But as we get our, some, as many of our departments to neutral or better, it gives this body and the mayor's office more flexibility, especially given the circumstances that we're having to work with. And that's, that's the point. So I, I'm, I apologize for not understanding your questions earlier. And if I frustrated you, it wasn't, it wasn't my intent. Yeah, and Phil, I think your answer is yes. There's, with these fees, there is money potentially left to go to the general fund that would be in the, in the black for his department. But I will also personally say one stormwater guy I don't think is enough because I don't think the stormwater guy is the guy checking and reviewing plans, and that's where we're f we're f sorely behind. So Agreed. I think you need two guys. Agree. And I would I, I, let me. For, you need two people, at least, and that's just this year. And 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 Mike, if you if be prepared at the commission meeting to. Uh, if, if I may be so bold as to ask that we, we understand the millions generated, not per lot, the millions anticipated to be generated. Jeff, y'all may have covered this at Planning Commission. I'd like to know the millions of dollars this will generate. I'd like the, the, the actual gross revenue from this yeah. proposal. And if the recession hits, it could be nothing. I'm not, and don't yeah. don't don't assume where I'm coming from. I want to know the millions that th they could, could go to zero. Just we're adding fees. Tell me how much it's going to be when when we're the fees come in. And I'm in support of raising these fees. I may be the one to make the motion. Some of the some of the thought process uh, going in that into this, and not wanting to put words in the mayor's mouth or the planning department's mouth, but some of the thought process going into this was keep doing things the way we've been doing things, we'll keep getting results the way we've been getting results. And I wanted to look at things differently, differently going forward because we're not the same county we were and we want to be the same county in the future that we are now. So we need to look at things differently. That's part of this process. You, 
I know we've been preaching that, the school system, everything else, planning, how we look at growth, um, plan for that growth in the future, how we want our county to look, all of those things require a different look. Just like the conversations we had on uh, transfer station tonight, you know, things we, we need to sure that we're looking out what's in the long-term best interest of the county and not just reacting. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that this is perfect or that this is even the best thing that we could come up with, but we didn't compare ourselves to Davidson County. We didn't compare ourselves to Williamson County. We didn't compare ourselves to Knox County. Some of those that we are approaching their population figures, we, we have a county that's contiguous to our county and that has a size that's similar, if not identical, to our planning staff and a growth rate from a percentage perspective. That's what we wanted to compare ourselves to, to see uh, we're aligning where we trying our best to take a different look. We've challenged our, our uh, planning department to do that with the comprehensive plan. And hopefully the comprehensive plan that comes before the county commission will look a lot different than the comprehensive plan now, simply because we're not the same county we were 10 years ago. And, and, and that's my perspective or my take. How, we're, how we've been doing things and how we've been doing things. So it's, it's it required a lot of, of this is, uh, this is a, an attempt to say, hey, uh, I think it better fits our county now and going forward to do that it's an attempt for us to continue the thought process that we've tried to start as a commission and in forward-looking instead of backward-looking and th that's part, just part of the process yes Michael I think I've got the numbers you're asking for um, so in fiscal year 2021 all of the revenues on this page not including school facilities tax okay all the revenues on this page generated $2,243,581. In FY22, so last year, all the revenues on this page, not including school facilities tax, generated $2,101,531. So we had a little less. Now I will tell you, um, this year, it could be even a little less. We have seen some slowing, uh, for example, in subdivision lot lot fees there we have a line item for subdivision lot fees that that item is down we will not make budget this year on that line item just based on the growth slowing so based on the numbers here just based on big round numbers you're not quite doubling but you're getting you're getting close to go to from 4,000 to almost 7,500 right uh, per per lot if I'm if I'm looking at the proposed rate so I mean you're looking at you know another million to a million and a half probably um, and fees. I mean, that's what this would generate, um, depending on, and that's kind of taking into account some slowing growth. So that probably was a little high on that number I gave you a second ago. But if you if you're kind of locked in that downward trend, it's it's in that range right there. Does that does that get you kind of what you were looking for? Exactly. That's what these have generated under our current fees. That's what we've generated the last two years. Thank you. So if you put their budget of it was 3.4 total. What was what was, Michael? You're talking about 3.5. Well, their their budget last year, the total for all three of their budgets last year was right at 3 million. It was actually a little over 2.9. Um, and their current budget this year is is going to be a little less than 3.4. That's probably a little a little generous, but but yes, it would come very close to covering their budget, give or take a couple hundred thousand. Okay. E either way, depending on how revenues come in. All right. So we're still we're still behind the eight ball a little bit. 
Uh, yes, you definitely could be if the, the current growth trends, have they kind of turned it down? Uh, yes. And I, and I think interest rates, I will tell you this, the other fee, uh, and, and piggybacking off this, because I want to be conservative here, we've noticed a trend, a growth, a slowing from even register of deeds. I think as interest rates have risen, planning, building, and codes fees have kind of come down a little bit, so is register of deeds on, on those filings. So I do want to be cognizant of that as we're looking at this and trying to cover, uh, you know, the cost of their, of their office. Okay. Did that kind of get you what you needed? Robert, you have a question? Yeah, about three. <laughs> so we'll start with the first one. We were talking about the cost of his department or departments. And I'm curious, uh, the FEMA homes that we've been buying out because of flooding, is that figured into your budget that we bought out over the last few years? Well, you need to add a lot of money to that figure to jack it on up some because so that how much is, money have we spent? Uh, well, that's been a that's been a topic of significant discussion in the last 90 days, and we don't have the money available. To, I think there are five homes, two in Rockvale, three on Old Last Old National Highway, and quite honestly, um, there's not the money there. However, having said that. The, the storm, um, Mike was telling me the stormwater fees would certainly assist us in covering that in the future. So it's something that is certainly I would like for us to take a hard look at on those stormwater fees, Commissioner, because it would go toward that specifically and offset those kind of things coming at generally come, that come out of the general fund currently. Well, there there have been several projects in the past that we have paid for already. So I'm saying that that is cost of ultimately that would go back to planning because that's where the mistakes were made that we didn't catch a pro potential problem and i'm not saying it a lot of it was because the fema maps were incorrect or whatever well i can anyway, tell you i'm not, I, I'm I, not I, trying to blame, blame no no well, but i want to be i want to answer that question because i know i can tell you where the blame is on all five of those houses three of those houses on old natural highway are so old before there were any codes that's that's number one number one so there is no fault there the fault on the two in rockvale is fema didn't extend their survey on the floodplain to include two houses two lots where two relatively new houses were built, and so now we find out in an area they didn't survey, FEMA, that those are now in floodplain. So those were the instances there. Yes, yeah, like I said, I'm not throwing blame at his Oh, absolutely I, not. I'm aware that these were pre, our planning department reviewing these and what FEMA had done, but that's a cost that we hadn't looked at that needs to be added if, if we're nickel and dime in this, trying to figure out, hey, how much do we owe? now? That gets me into my second and third questions, and Chairman Phillips answered part of it and why you went to Will Williamson when you've got Hamilton County that's almost the same size as us. Uh, you know, of course, Knox, uh, Davidson, Shelby, you know, we're the top five counties in this in the state, and what the costs are and the way we're, we're growing astronomically, you know, uh, and we're going to have to be able to figure out how to pay for this. Now, <coughs> I'm not saying all of it needs to be there, but I don't think that it's fair just looking at this figure and saying, well, we're close enough to Wilson County. I think, I'd like to see the numbers from, uh, I mean, Wilson County. I'd like to see the numbers from uh, Hamilton and from Williamson County to compare to Wilson's County uh, to see what their costs are. Now. That gets me into my third question, and I'll get back to Michael on this. Our debt per year is an estimate. I think you said it would be we'd add about 14 or 15 million per year to our debt because of schools. Is that a round figure we can we can play with? Um, it depends on if we're including the 60, like for an elementary school, the high schools. We're in that 12 to 15 million range additional for next year. And then if you were to include the elementary school, the transfer station and um, a potential forensic center and the I-24 project, you're looking at about 18 million a year, give or, give or take a couple hundred thousand. Okay, now here's the reason I, I was throwing that figure out. I, and I, I said 15 million, that's, that's, you know, basically schools without, and that's one of the things that we've, we've recognized is our schools, of course, roads are there, police, fire, everything is there. Uh, trash, of course.
but uh, we built 885 single family dwelling homes last year. Divide that into, I think, 15 million, or I may have used 14, I forget what, but that comes out to about $15,000 per household. So that's exactly what somebody moving into this community is costing us, around $15,000 per household. Now, what are we charging them per household now? All of you that have got about a three hundred dollars to $400,000 home, you know what it's costing you, and it's not anything where near $15,000, I promise you. But if you want to be looking at what those numbers should be, as far as cost to us, then that's your number, $15,000 per household. That's what it's cost in this county. Just on schools. All right. What's your pleasure? I, I'm a m member of this committee, and I can only <laughs> say that with this committee. <laughs> uh, but I attend every committee meeting and uh, have been well educated on certain things that are kind of going on that uh, maybe I knew a little bit about but not a lot about so this year has been a, a, a very interesting year for me I know the mayor has experienced the same kind of an education as it relates to uh, workings of the county um, I, I would um, uh, put it in motion Adopt alternative fees, the ones that are on the chart, uh, with the uh, understanding that uh, it will take it up to that, that proposed math is correct to seven thousand five hundred and five dollars. I, I think that would be the motion. Uh, and this only covers planning and engineering. We also need to discuss uh, permits. Uh, probably should be some discussion on that as well. If the motion should cover permits, uh, then we probably need to discuss that before. So uh, is it appropriate for us to talk about planning and engineering and then separate motion for uh, permits? Is that is that? Talk about the permits that are in there. I can just say that the permit numbers that you see on the screen are similar to what, um, they're similar in either proposal, and that's based on the figure she gave you a little earlier. So that part of it's not changing. So that the 88, that, yeah, the 88,000 that you're seeing there, and of course the school's facilities tax isn't changing either, so, but. Yeah. So that this, taking it from, um, Proposed fees that's coming out of planning at. Uh, yeah, the, the proposed fees coming out of the planning, is, planning versus the alternative, right? And and the alternative that we're talking about now is seven fifty. Does that include uh, fifty five cents uh, per square foot that we're talking about as far as? Does that include all of Tanya's information as well. So I, I'm, I'm talking about your department right now. Does, so does, it's my does, understanding, Commissioner, that the front page is planning and engineering, and the back side of that page, where you see construction-related fees, that would be Tanya's. Okay. So is this, okay. I stand corrected. Thank you. So, so the the motion would be to adopt uh, planning and engineering, and then we could have a separate motion to talk about. Tanya's department. Okay, th that would be the motion that we adopt this um, alternative fees that are on this spreadsheet that was passed out uh, with us tonight. Uh, and that's uh, uh, different than the proposed fees that come out of planning. Uh, and th really the, the, the uh, motion, it, it's not going to cover a lot of things that uh, some 
commissioners think it, that it should cover, but we're increasing our fees by quite a bit. And in my mind, it's a step that needs to be taken uh, in the right direction for us to plan uh, not only for this coming year, but for uh, the future as well. So my motion would be to it adopt to these alternative fees. And if I'm not mistaken, it would take the uh, Rutherford County proposed fees from our money. That fee. 7505, if, if that math is correct. Is that right, Doug? It, well, for that size subdivision, when you look at the, the others, it, 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 it's right around 7500. It varies a little bit based on the number of lots. We just adopted yeah. this fee. That'll get you pretty close to those numbers that okay. are on the Th far that, right. That's my motion, if it's appropriate, Mr. Chairman. It, may, may I offer a suggestion to your motion? You, you sure can. Uh, could, could you... Uh, make sure or make note that this goes to budget for approval as well as full commission for approval? To, it, to, to me, it's understood, but uh, right. yes, it, it, and forwarded on to budget uh, with a positive recommendation. Right, and, and with hopes of a July 1st uh, implementation date. Yes, absolutely. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are you want to go on the board? Yes, I have to. Commissioner Piercy? Yes. Commissioner P? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner James? No. Commissioner Dodd? Yes. Commissioner Phillips? Yes. Chairman Cush? Yes. Motion passes. May I request two minute recess? Yes. Recess, five, five, okay, three, three minutes. We're on the very, very home stretch. All right, Tanya, um, we are gonna talk about your fee schedule and uh, I believe, do you have anything to say or do we wanna just jump right into the meat of it? You jump right in. All right, uh, so we just, uh, we just uh, made it a, a well, no, go ahead, go ahead. If, Jeff, if I'm I, looking at you. If I could ask a couple of questions, um, and, and that's the reason I wanted these two separate because I thought they would, should be separate motions since they're kind of, in essence, uh, separate departments. Uh, in your presentation, um, the average cost of building permits was somewhere in the neighborhood of 17 hundred and fifty dollars ours is currently slightly over a thousand bucks correct almost uh, eleven almost eleven hundred bucks correct so we're six hundred and fifty dollars or so below what the average shy is. of the average yes and to get us to that 1750 your recommendation would be take us from what's currently the average of 35 cents a square foot up to 55 cents a square foot. Correct, to reach the average, yes. So, so we're thinking, I'm thinking along the same lines you yep. are, yep. and I just want to make sure that. Uh, so to get us to 1750 uh, uh, would, would equate to $55 a square foot. 55 uh, cents. 55 cents. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, but also in this comparison to Wilson County, Wilson County is currently at 70 cents a square foot. Correct. So if we took ours to 70 cents a square foot, what additional revenue would that produce for your department? Because your department is the one that's doing more and more and more follow-up inspections and follow-ups. So what would that take it from 55, the proposed 55 up to 70 cents, what would that do as far as a revenue generator? To my existing, so currently, that would only apply to new construction. So currently my new construction permits um, is probably, is Michael still here? He's gone. Um, if I had to guess, it's about 900,000, give or take, of my current revenue. It would take that 900,000 and double it. So I would probably um, 1.8, 1.9 million. So, so that would um, that would add about a million dollars to my revenue. revenue, and it would take it from seventeen fifty up to two thousand twenty-two hundred. Yeah, and that would take us from the middle of the pack 
to closer to the top of the pack at, yes. at that particular yes the highest uh, the highest permit that uh, was the city of franklin it was 23 a little better than 2300 the next next highest was wilson county at 2240. so once again not wanting to 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 look at something that's neutral but to look forward as it relates to your department and what your departments may need next year and or two or three or four or five years down the road yes. whatever that case may be um, I, i'm going to make a motion and and uh, if that's okay then we can have all kinds of discussion and i can be fussed at but instead of uh, taking it to the 1750 which is an average of 55 cents a square foot that we take it uh, to 70 cents a square foot to match what Wilson County is doing since we've had all this comparison to Wilson County. That's my motion. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Let's open for discussion if we have any. All right, seeing none, you want to roll call, Rachel? Mr. Piercy. He, he's left. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Commissioner James. No. Commissioner Dodd. Yes. Commissioner P. Yes. Commissioner Phillips. Yes. Chairman Cush. Yes. All right, that motion. Let, let me add that caveat that it goes into effect July 1st and also goes to budget with a record with a uh, 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 approval uh, for them to approve. Yes. Fan fantastic. So, All right. Before we leave, can yes. we discuss the flat fees and the 30% I had added to the flat fees and the remodel, the other permits that didn't, that doesn't apply to new construction? If you'll recall um, that the fee that you just increased applies to new new single family dwellings and new construction. Okay. Um, can we discuss the flat fees and the other the other fees we can discuss anything you want to discuss uh don't confuse me okay it's, it's all right i'll try night. not to and uh, let me just say that new construction to me is different than a person wanting to add on to their house correct i uh, don't remodel want, remodel I, their home right. um i, I just add don't a swimming think pool um do an addition they're not adding to uh, roads or Correct. anything else so the infrastructure is already there and, and that should be at a lesser rate and and right. that's what you've tried to accomplish yes. here okay. yes yep it, it it equated to uh, about 29 percent yeah well yeah almost 30 yeah right it, and those those increases or her proposed uh, increases or should be on the board on the on the right hand side uh for flat fees and uh bottom of the left column and the entire right column right a few a couple of those are brand new fees some are just an increase uh for a inflation and b just an increase to uh cover costs yes sir chairman no the gross revenue this increase would generate the flat fee the this flat fees oh my gosh um probably about two hundred thousand if even that that's going to be pretty much just covering the cost of doing business in your department. Sure. So yes, I mean we've seen as Michael just he's gone, but as as he just explained, when we increased our fees in 2016, we had plenty of cushion in 2016, and that gap between our revenue and our budget has slowly decreased. And this year, I'm pretty sure I'll be upside down. I'll be in the red this year for sure. This these fees. I think is also a, a pretty good starting point and we can re-examine those next year as, as she gets figures back from what the cost of running that department may be <laughs> but the the square footage is is the big one that uh, could potentially um, put us in the black yes for sure all right do we have yes Joshua what is the frequency to which you you have raised these fees in the past um, about every six to eight years uh, we did it in 2016 was the last increase July of 2016 it's been a while I think before that before that it was 2009 
Okay. Uh, any questions for Tanya? And would anybody like to entertain a motion up or down? You're comfortable I am. with this fee schedule? I am comfortable with this, yes. With, with that recommendation, I move to approve as presented and forward to budget with a positive recommendation. Effective date we July 1st. We have a motion, a second with uh, all staff comments. Uh, uh, Chairman Dodd. All right, on the board. Well, I, I don't see any comments. <coughs> Commissioner Phillips? Yes. Commissioner Dodd? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Absolutely. Commissioner P? Yes. Commissioner James? Yes. Chairman Cush? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Uh, thank you, Tanya. And thank all three of you for uh, the heroic effort you put in into uh, yeah, crunching these numbers multiple times with multiple scenarios. Uh, it was a Herculean task and uh, this body certainly appreciates that. And you may get to do it again in, uh, on Thursday. So, uh, th th not this Thursday, but thank you all very much. Um, any other business? Gentlemen, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Robert, Chairman. I had a quick shout out to my daughter, Rachel, and her husband, Kyle, for their anniversary today. Aww. And also for my wife, who's had to put up for me for 42 years on the same day. Oh, man. So happy anniversary. Yes. And you had to spend it here. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody.